uh, let's get things starting. So we are at um, uh, one past the hour. So welcome everybody to the Society for Ancient Medicine and Pharmacology uh, panel on the emotions and the body in Greco-Roman medicine. Um, uh, and as I said, I'm trying to get uh, our closed caption. Okay, live transcript is available. Thank you so much, Molly. I appreciate that, uh, putting that in. Yeah, that's okay. great. Okay. So everyone, my name is Eileen Doss, the incoming vice president of the Society for Ancient Medicine and Pharmacology. I'm an associate professor in classical studies and Middle East studies at the University of Michigan. And uh, to be honest, I've been belatedly drafted in to facilitate what I'm sure will be a very stimulating event in place of SAMS, uh, that would be the acronym for Society for Ancient Medicine and Pharmacology, somehow not SAMP, but uh, it is what it is. Um, Sam's incoming. Uh, so I've been uh, drafted to replace um, or rather stand in Colin Webster's stead, who's the incoming president. As we've just been discussing, he is on daddy duty. He, him and his spouse just had a baby yesterday. Uh, so yay, you know, happy yeah. times. You know, I, I think it's particularly pleasing to uh, share such happy news and what continues to be very troubling times. Before I provide a brief introduction to the panel's theme, I want to acknowledge that the past 48 hours has been extremely distressing to those of us living and working in the United States, as well as to many abroad. Personally, it has taken quite an emotional toll on me. Um, as a brown woman who grew up in the American South, it was downright triggering to see the Confederate flag raised in the Capitol Rotunda a few days ago. And I'm conscious that many of you are probably feeling much the same way. And I really don't have the heart to make a pun or connect this emotional upset to the ancient material. So if those of you who are perhaps a little bit more robust uh, can do so. Um, on a more practical note, I want to explain the structure of this event. We have five speakers who will be, who will be speaking for around 20 minutes. After each talk, I will open um, our virtual floor for questions. I ask everyone to paste their questions in the chat box, which I will then read in order. This method of processing questions ensures that I do not overlook anyone, which is more likely to happen if we do the raise hand, or as I say, the jazz hand function. Of course, I invite the questioner to unmute themselves or intervene if they would like to expand on their question. For instance, would like to follow up after they receive an answer. So I do want uh, a back and forth exchange, but just uh, initially please paste your question or uh, the bare bones of the question in the chat box so I can just create a, uh, a sequence or an order. And after the five talks, I will moderate a short communal discussion during which we can think through some of the issues and commonalities that the five speakers papers raise about the emotions. Now regarding the panel's theme, I'm very much looking forward to the following talks, not just because many of them are about Galen, my research specialty, but also because the emotions are such a generative subject for examining issues relating to embodiment, liminality, disciplinarity, and personhood. As I'm sure we will hear, the emotions trouble the mind-body divide and thus open a space for different disciplinary stakeholders, such as doctors, philosophers, and poets, to name just a few, to position themselves in their techni, crafts, arts, knowledge area, that very gappy term, techne, as the authorities on this subject matter. Epistemic control over the realms of both the body and the soul falls to the one who is able to make the emotions explicable and accordingly treatable. Involved in this pathologizing and remedying of emotions is also the right to impose norms of behavior and education, which extends the practitioner's significance and control into other realms of social life. Anyway, perhaps we can pick up some of these themes and uh, at the end of our session in our communal discussion. So there's a lot to really kind of get um, to grab our, I was gonna say grab our hands, but you know, there's virtuality to it. So I guess, Touch can be hot. I'm not going there with kind of uh, explaining uh, touch. So I now want to turn to introduce our first speaker, um, who is Ralph Rosen. So Ralph Rosen is Barton uh, Gregorian Professor of the Humanities and Classical Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. He has published broadly on many aspects of Greek and Latin literature and culture with particular focus on ancient comedy and satire, Greco-Roman medicine and Galen in particular. 
his, um, he is currently co-editor with Peter Singer and Julie Lascaris of the Oxford Handbook of Galen, which is forthcoming sometime in the not too distant future. <laughs> so Ralph's, uh, yeah, I was going to say, inshallah. Um, yeah. So the, his, Ralph's talk is, gonna, is entitled Galen on Natural Personalities, Intractable Souls, and Bodily Mixtures. So let's give a warm welcome to the stage, uh, to Ralph, <laughs> and turn hey. the floor over to him. Thank you, everybody. Um, I'm just trying to put I don't know why I can't. I, I'm going to share my screen with the handout, but I don't know why it's not going into the chat. Uh, so I will not waste more time with that. And thank you for your introduction, um, Eileen. And um, it's funny, you mentioned the events of the last couple of days. I won't go, if we could talk forever about that. But I had, it's funny, in my original version of this talk, I had a line or two about our president. Um, uh, in terms of personality disorders and person and mixtures of the body. I took it out in the interest of time, but now you could kind of imagine it back in. I'm not gonna put it back in for now, but anyway. Okay, um, let me share my screen. Screen, and see whether. Share screen. Okay, can people see that? Yeah, good, okay. All right. Okay, across the history of Greek medicine, we find a continual unresolved tension and aporia on the question of how much external factors such as education, training, or discourse can influence the con configuration of the raw bodily material each of us is born with. Such questions were particularly pertinent to Greek doctors who needed to know exactly what they were treating in a suffering patient before considering how to do so. Was it the behavior of their patients, for example, that was making them sick? Or was their behavior a function of a physical pathology? Galen had the benefit of six centuries of thinking about such topics, but across all of his psychological writings, that familiar tension remains between a belief on the one hand that medical intervention can sometimes treat dysfunctions of behavior and character, and his concession on the other that an individual's inherent natural physiological makeup presents at least some limitations for the doctor trying to help a person control or alter his emotions and affect. The join between the body and the soul or the mind, um, however, remained difficult for Galen to nail down. And without really knowing what the soul actually was, as he famously talks about in, in other works, um, there's always a bit of a, a gray area in knowing what exactly to target in any behavioral intervention. Galen stated at the beginning of the capacities of the soul depend on the mixtures of the body, which I will be henceforth referring to by its uh, Latin acronym uh, QAM, that um, we, quote, we bring about good mixture in the body through what we eat and drink, and also through our daily practices. And from this good mixture, we'll achieve virtue for the soul, kind of famous programmatic statement at the beginning of that work, QAM. But interesting complications begin to emerge when he attempts to illustrate this thesis by observing children. A movie makes at some point in all his psychological works actually. Children were, for Galen, heuristically useful because he felt one could observe in them a, a personality that is the behavioral manifestations of a specific mixture in its most fundamental form, unmediated by training or education or by the internal guidance of a rational faculty. Galen's use of children, however, brought him uh, into highly contested area among his contemporaries over classic questions of nature and nurture in accounting for behavior as he lays out his thinking on what constitutes a personality, an, eth uh, an ethos, and what it means to judge a person's behavior morally. Often when he takes up a discussion of children's character, he makes analogies with animals or plants to illustrate a point, particularly since children seemed closer than adults to animals um, uh, uh, whose, whose rationality 
was regarded as either non-existent or at best uncertain. The specific questions I'm interested in today then concern one of these animal analogies that Galen makes in Affections and Errors appended to a discussion of children whose characters are intractable, so extreme in their, in their behavior that their moral and presumably physiological constitutions cannot be altered by any sort of intervention. Galen spends more time on this analogy than the others he uses when discussing children, and it offers, as I'd like to argue today, some interesting if perplexing nuance to his views on human character and behavior as a function of nature. So before we turn to the passage in Affections and Errors for Closer Examination, it will be helpful to note a few passages from QAM and a work Character Traits that provide some background uh, to the philosophical issues Galen was grappling with. At the most fundamental level, Gale, um, Galen is concerned with what we might call the natural and naturalness of nature. That is, if character and affect are a function of bodily mixtures, how do we come to evaluate human be behavior morally? If they are natural in a material sense, how can we say, as we often do when confronted with their most extreme forms, that some are unnatural? In the Arabic epitome that we have of character traits, which is handout number one, uh, Galen at one point notes that nature and habit combine to form character traits, ethos. So there's a little bit of a punning with habit, ethos, uh, combined to form character traits, ethos, eta, and offers an analogy with the behavior of dogs. I do not deny, he says, that nature plays some part in this, for if someone happens to be afflicted with an evil nature that inclines towards wickedness and takes pleasure in filthy conversation, it's like the nature of dogs, which takes pleasure in sniffing at genitals and eating excrement. Beware then of inclining quickly towards that which you would like, and do not think that everything towards which you incline is true and good. The passage raises any number of questions. Chief among them is why what is natural for dogs is left alone as natural, whereas what is natural for humans, when it starts to look like the behavior of dogs, comes in for moral censure. The human acts who acts like a dog here is afflicted with an evil nature, while the dog is apparently just acting like a dog. One might wonder whether the analogy in fact undercuts somewhat Galen's assumption that a person whose nature makes them behave like a dog is necessarily evil. Galen doesn't raise this point here, but it's something he's thought about in various ways, um, as, we can, as we can see from a passage in QAM where he wrestles again with the tension between the naturalness of character traits and one's moral accountability for them. And at number two, you won't read the entire thing, but parts of it. Um, for those who hold that all human beings are receptive to virtue, which is equivalent to saying that no one is born naturally bad, stoic view, and those who hold that none chooses justice for its own sake, both have a partial view of human nature, he says. For not everyone is naturally hostile to justice, nor is everyone naturally a friend to it. And in each case, they have become as they are through the mixtures of their bodies, and echoing this theme that we saw in QAM. Um, okay, sorry, earlier in QAM. Uh, how then, they say, may someone rightly be praised or blamed, hated or loved when that person has become wicked or good, not by his own agency, but by virtue of the mixture, he obviously derives from other causes. Okay, very Galenic. Our reply is that there is something that is a property of all of us to embrace, accept, and love the good and to reject, hate, and avoid the bad. So to be sure, we destroy scorpions, poisonous spiders, and vipers, which have become as they are, not by their own agency, but by that of nature. Now Galen, and there's more, we'll come back to some of the next, the last paragraph in a little bit. 
Galen is aware, of course, that his physicalist foundation of character, his obsession with mixtures here, um, uh, makes it harder to blame people for their behavior since their actions are a function of their mixtures. And to be consistent with that on that principle, one would have to forgive even the most extreme examples. To get around this conclusion, Galen has to resort, as we've seen, to a different argument from nature, namely that humans are somehow kind of nebulously, naturally inclined, is parche tuta pasin humin, amen naturally inclined to love the good and hate the bad almost reflexively. That is, without taking the time to find out what the origin of the goodness or badness was. So, as we might say, ignorance of badness does not exonerate one's bad behavior. But another animal analogy, a little unsettling if we think about its applicability to humans, complicates the matter further. Scorpions, spiders, and vipers are just by nature, bad, at least from a human perspective, and can't help their behavior. So this justifies us somehow in killing them whenever we have the chance. The obvious anthropocentrism here is not my concern, but rather the continual awkwardness of the argument from the animal world in attempting to make a point about human nature. A little later in the same passage of QAM, Galen returns to the topic of children, noting uh, in a pointedly anti-Stoic passage that he says, there are extremely few children born with a, with a good nature for virtue. I don't think I have this on the handout, sorry. Um, okay, there are extremely few children born with a good nature for virtue and, um, and uh, concluding with a view that he ascribes to Posidonius uh, who himself was a Stoic, but on this point, Galen positions him as something of an outlier in Stoicism, but he's proving of this. He ascribes this to Posidonius handout number three, where he says, there is indeed a seed of badness, though a tescakia sperma, within ourselves. And we all require not so much to avoid the wicked, the, the, the wicked as to pursue those who will cleanse us and prevent the growth of this badness. This rather pessimistic, almost lapsarian view of human nature raises many questions that Galen doesn't ever address. In particular, what he even means by badness when applied to children whose lives are driven by ingenuous, non-rational emotions and desires, and as he has just said, can't really be held responsible for whatever badness they may exhibit. But we may perhaps find some further Galenic spin on this matter in the passage from Affections and Errors that we've been preparing for. In this passage, Galen tells us about one of his young friends who, has, who had asked him why he, the friend, always felt distressed at trivial matters, while Galen never seemed distressed even by great ones a topic some of you will well know that he also writes about at length in the recently recovered Avoiding Distress or Perialupias, which I think I'm gonna be hearing about a little more later in another paper. Specifically, his friend wants to know whether Galen's equanimity was a result of training, askesis, following a certain doctrine or something inborn in him, something about his nature. Galen's answer is essentially, all of the above. We are born with a certain nature, he says, we imitate those we grow up with, and later we benefit from doctrine and training. He proceeds to address each stage in order, but we're gonna focus on his discussion of small children in whom he felt we can observe nature in its most unmediated form. So if we go to handout number four, um, the fact that there are great individual differences in nature can manifestly be learned from the children we see about us being carried around. So that, that'll tell you that little quick little in passing image will show that he's thinking of, you know, very young children, um, infants and toddlers, I guess we'd say. Um, the, the, that they're being, you can observe them in children being carried around. 
Some are always cheerful, others sullen, some are ready to laugh at anything while others cry on the smallest pretext. And he actually goes on, he continues at length in this vein with other examples, agreeing with what all people observe in children. That, so it's, he believes, he regards this as pretty obvious. You know, you could just see it. So everyone agrees on this, he said. Um, namely that children show a broad spectrum of personalities often diametrically opposed, opposed to one another. People call children by adjectives that describe their various natures, their fusées. Uh, handout number five. Some are receptive to good education. Others receive no benefit from it. Yet this is no reason. Uh, this is no reason to neglect children. Rather, they should be nurtured in the best possible habits. If their nature is able to receive the benefits of this care, um, they may become good men. If it could not receive it, at least there would be no blame attaching to us. So all of you out there who are parents of children, you can use that as a kind of, as your kind of aphorism about parenting. It's not my fault. Okay, so among the questions that this passage, is, passage raises is what exactly Galen thinks accounts for the fact that one child's fusus is or is not able to, as he says, receive the benefit of external influences such as education. And what criterion determines whether one's inborn nature is good or bad, something that needs to be trained or is just naturally fine the way it is. If extreme emotions such as anger or a desire for vengeance, as he discusses at length in character traits, are natural and permissible in children, at what point does anger become an affection, a pathos, as it is in adults whom Galen would continually call uh, well, well, translated as irascible. If anger is natural and appropriate in some circumstances, let's say the toddler, the child, but unnatural and bad in others, the irascible adult, where is that transformation taking place? And what does it imply at a physiological and moral level? In his attempt to clarify his position on innate nature and what it means to intervene in it, he offers an analogy with plants and non-human animals. It's difficult, however, to decide whether this passage provides nuance to Galen's views or muddies the waters even further. And how this is the main, or sort of the main show here. <laughs> um, this is handout number six. Um, okay, so it's hard, we'll be reading parts of it in a second, but it's hard to know how carefully Galen was thinking through the details of this analogy. And he does qualify it somewhat with the phrase paraplesia post, kind of in a way it's something like this, but it's useful to trace the, its implications for the later argument about children, sorry, the larger argument about children and human behavior. The analogy raises a question from the outset about what we think we are doing to a child when we attend to their upbringing, their Diago game. All of Galen's examples from the non-human world involve attempts to manipulate an organism's inherent nature, some of which turn out to be intractable. But let's see if we can make sense of Galen's thinking here. So looking, looking at that passage, he says at the beginning, the farmer will never make bramble bramble bear grapes, for its nature is from the outset not able to accept that kind of completion. Well, it's not really clear why this is useful for Galen as an analogy to educating a human child. It seems like saying that we can never make a human child produce a dog as offspring. This merely states the obvious that species a species has fixed biological parameters. But the next statement gets interesting. Then he says, he may, on the other hand, by his negligence, causing them to rely on nature alone, make vines, which are in themselves perfectly suitable for bearing fruit, bear very poor fruit, or indeed none at all. The Galen has now moved to a specific species and focuses on their natural capacities. It's in the nature of a grapevine to produce grapes, left alone in the wild, neglected by humans, and reliant only on their nature. Refusis, as Galen puts it, they will produce poor fruit. Well, what constitutes poor fruit, one might ask? <laughs> By what or whose criterion? Galen would answer teleologically, 
a grapevine that has realized its potential by producing fruit as abundantly as possible will be the best grapevine. He never adds, from a human perspective at least, uh, since they rely on abundant fruit for good wine, and he implies rather that nature may well be an impediment here in achieving that telos. We would doubtless answer in Darwinian anti-teleological anti terms, nature is what it is, and a vine will produce whatever and however conditions allow. Whatever it produces is neither good nor bad. Galen's point that nature as such does not always guarantee that a creature will realize its full potential applies to children too. Every child is born with an idiosyncratic nature, but left alone to a life according to nature might well, it, the child might never live the best life it can, judged according to a calculus of virtue and emotional contentment. This much is a fairly traditional view by Galen's time, as many of you will realize, recalling debates that go back to Plato about the nature, the dangers of living according to nature and Aristotelian teleologies of human virtue. It's a view one might note that sees human nature left uncultivated and in its natural state as something quite fragile and imperfect. But how does Galen's third example map onto human children and their natures? He says, among animals too, through education, you may make a horse useful for a variety of purposes. A bear, on the other hand, may seem tame at some time, but that's not the animal stable, the monomon, the stable condition, while a viper or a scorpion will never even reach the stage of seeming to be tamed. How did the cases of the horse and the bear map, map onto child, human children, which you've been discussing, you remember? Each animal has its natural endowments, and it just so happens that a horse at least has the capacity to be made to serve human needs. But bears do not. They have a fixed nature, which makes them wild and untamable. Even more fixed and intractable from a human perspective are, once again, vipers and scorpions. These analogies then map a normal child onto the vine or the horse. Uh, both can be altered and bettered by external intervention, but the intractable child, uh, having a constitution by nature physically, um, physically uh, unalterable and morally untrainable, is like, sorry, that, that sentence is all messed up. The intractable child like that is like the bear or the scorpion. That's the point I want to make. Is it possible to offer a moral judgment of the behavior of a scorpion when they are merely acting as nature has made them to do? Galen sees no good in them at all and assumes we will destroy them whenever we encounter them. On his analogy between children with intractable natures and animals that are similarly bad, is he recommending we exterminate such children in the same way? He certainly recommends, and this, if you go back to handout two again, I think it's two, the end of two, right at the end, the last paragraph. He's, uh, he certainly recommends that we hate and put to death quite reasonably adults who have been deemed incurably wicked. And he goes, gives you the reasons for that here. I won't read them out now in the interest of time. Um, with children though, well, Galen just doesn't go there. So he doesn't get into that. And he probably would have a response that, you know, there's potential for them. There's always some potential for them to get better. I'm, I'm not sure what he would say, but he does refer to the problem is that he does often return, refer to some children as simply unworkable, un intractable, can't do anything with them. Um, but we're justified, I think. He doesn't go and he doesn't really approach this. He doesn't really deal with it, but we are justified, I think, in asking what he actually thought he was illustrating with this animal analogy and affections and errors in the first place especially when in so many ways, Galen would hold that humans are actually not like the animals he's comparing them to and would place them as humans at a higher level of value in the Aristotelian scala naturae that he inherited. It's one thing after all to say simply that children will need to have their nature trained the way we train grapes to produce the best fruit or horses to serve human needs. 
but by pressing on with the analogy to other animals that are naturally unable to be trained, he exposes the fault lines between a biological physicalist view of nature and a moralizing one. Thank you, and leave it at that. I'm okay, is the timing good? Okay. Yeah, we're... yeah, we're good. <laughs> All right. You're good, thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, um, so I, if you feel comfortable, um, maybe we can have a couple uh, qu um, questions that you would like to uh, answer. So does anybody want to intervene uh, first and ask Ralph a question? Or I, I will. Now, now I see your five minute call, oops. It's all, right, it's all right, I know it's one of those things that you have to uh, like, you know, you're reading your paper and yeah. then uh, having the timing call. So I didn't yeah, okay. to Yeah, yeah, it's just, yeah. Okay, um, fine. Uh, I don't, okay, okay, see, so I have, um, Daniel, do you want to uh, ask your question, please? Unmute yourself. Yeah, hi. Uh, hi, thanks, hey, Ralph. Oh, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Okay, good, good. Good, thanks so much for that paper. That was really, really interesting. Um, I'd like to ask, I guess, uh, I recently read a paper by Jennifer Whiting about Aristotle's conception of moral development as uh, using his hylomorphic uh, or actuality potentiality distinction and the famous yeah, kind of victim that that art completes nature. So I was wondering here if the if the phusis is the physical mixture of the body from the from the uh, you know the five canonic or four canonical elements, are they in any way or do you think Galen is yeah. open to the idea that that is in one way the matter for moral development which will be taken on later by their by their elders who will impose the form of kind of virtue onto their as yet unformed souls. Yeah, I think or, or I mean, as I, not, not fully teleologically realized souls. Yeah, well. yeah, no, I think I think that's right. And I think I think that uh, the there's a lot of Aristotelianism in Galen, as one would know, he was quite a pluralist and eclectic, but um, he doesn't in the ethical works where he he talks about these issues mostly, you know, more concentrated form. Um, you know, Aristotle looms, but he doesn't put things in quite that um, technical a term, largely because these works are a little bit, they're a little bit more, for the most part, popularizing. I don't know, the practical ethics. I think they're, they're guides. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think short answer to that is that he would be sympathetic to that and would say that something some, some, he would conceptualize the formation of character along the, along those lines. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. So um, I think we're going to do two more questions. So Claire first and then Leslie. So please, Claire, would you unmute yourself? Hi, Claire. Hi. Thanks, Ralph. That was really interesting. Um, okay. It raised for me a passage that I've always found puzzling. Uh, and I wonder if this would kind of tie in with what you've been talking about. Um, so at the end, the very end of On the Construction of the Embryo. Yes, yeah, with the vice, right? Scorpions. I know, um, again, it's the same thing, yeah. Yeah, but there he has this interesting point that they are intrinsically evil and that it would actually be blasphemous to say that nature had a hand in creating them. And in fact, there's some sort of force of evil that's different from this um, teleological force of good that he spends all of um, usefulness of the parts right. talking about. So is there then, are there irredeemably just evil, like is there a source of evil in Galen's understanding of the cosmos that is responsible for evil people that we somehow need to differentiate from people who are like okay but kind of subpar? Um, yeah. I, I think this, the scorpion motif really is a fascinating one in Galen. It is a fascinating one and that, that pass, of course that passage, which is, I'm glad you brought that up, um, that whole passage at the end of Formation of Thetis, he's, what's so wonderful about it, he's, he's really struggling to try to kind of like deal with this. Uh, and they're also like the various ways people, other people have approached, he's trying to decide which, where he wants to come out on. But to answer directly your question, I think, yeah, I think he, when he talks about there being a seed of evil, kakia, in everyone, no matter what, there's a seed there. Uh, that I think that definitely is in line with his thought that sometimes that seed grows and if it's not cultivated properly, it will grow into like pure evil. So these are extremes obviously for him and, and he doesn't fixate on them a lot, but he does acknowledge often that it's there and it's a possibility. And so in, the, in his, you know, his grand scheme of the cosmos, definitely 
Um, one of the things I think you remember, you can remind me, it says in that formation of the fetus passage is that, you know, Plato, you know, Plato wouldn't really get like, they don't really count, you know, they're bad. Why would somebody, you know, uh, give them any kind of stature or status in the world, in the cosmos? So um, he really has trouble with that. And so the sh again, short answer is I think, yes, he, he thinks that there are things that are inherently, have an inherently evil nature. And that's why he says repeatedly, when we see them, we, you know, we need to stomp on them. We need to kill them as if we're doing a service. So it's, it's a really, you know, nature is a horrifying thing often in, in his view. It's a great yeah. question. Thank you. I'm going to agree on stomping uh, uh, scorpions. It's probably not going to make me any friends. Uh, anyway, um, <laughs> Leslie, would you please uh, unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah. Hi, um, hi, hi, Ralph. Hey. Sorry about the lighting. I have to be where I am for very. Oh, soon. that's all right. Sorry. Yeah. But um, and I missed the very beginning of your talk, so this may have been addressed. But as regarding um, stomping on adults who yeah. are irredeemably evil. Um, in, in the number two on the handout, it's said to be um, an example to stop other people from doing similar crimes. Right. So is this more a punishment for things they have actually done rather than recognizing just somebody who's irascible um, and, you know, uh, how how would you how does somebody um, evince the evil in their nature other than doing crimes that deserve the death penalty anyway? And so, if if it's a crime that's being punished, is is this um, anything different from what other people would do? And if it's a crime that's being punished, wouldn't that mean that you're not going to put naughty children to death because they haven't done crimes. Yeah, no, right. Well, so yes, I think that's, that's, yes. So I think that's a really good point. Um, I'd say there that he would, uh, and it's true, I was being really mostly rhetorical about wondering what he would say about children if you follow, if you follow the argument that someone is incurably wicked, you're saying that, well, you know, you can't, you don't punish when, punish somebody for the fact of wickedness only for the actions that, that right. the crimes. You don't yeah, think nasty people to death. The, the thing that, that's them. interesting about this, and this is like for another people who are interested in the history of you know punishment and, and prisons and things like that. It's interesting that um, there's nothing particularly rehabilitative about his comments here in the sense that they're already, he calls them incurab incurably wicked. So you can't, like they're mixtures. If you get at the physiological level, which is also what really interests me, it's like, you would think like, what is it about the mixtures and the configuration at the bodily level that he's thinking can't be fixed? Um, and so it's really probably sort of ex post fact that you observe that somebody, you can't, I can't deal with this person anymore, no matter what, he's just a bad person. And so you've, you've got to figure out a theoretical scheme that would explain it. Um, at the physical level, but yeah, I mean, I think I, I think I think you've answered the question about the rhetorical question about what he, why we don't why he wouldn't advocate exterminating children, but I think he would be very he's very wary of that of someone who's you know show it well I guess as we are too you know showing evidence early on of a of a badness which is incurable and then. And then, of course, and there's all these other questions that, that got me interested in this to begin with is like, again, defining that badness, like what is it exactly? Is it, is it, completely, is it completely contingent and cultural and social? Uh, or is he able to, to think about something which is biologically inherently in nature bad? The way, he the way he kind of implies is the case with his animal analogies, if you see what I mean. So yeah, good, good, good question. Great, good stuff. All right. I guess it, 
we're out of yeah we're out of time yeah like well, but we we can all circle that the um to these themes uh during our communal discussion because I, I did have uh, a question for you but maybe i'll raise that in the uh, okay. uh the communal discussion so let us all uh finger clap <laughs> or uh, clap uh ralph and thank you uh, turn now to our next speaker, which is Chiara Blanco. Uh, Chiara Blanco is a research lecturer in classics at Trinity College, uh, University of Oxford, and the co-founder of the research network Body in Medicine in Latin Poetry. Her main research interests lie in the intersections between ancient literature, Greek tragedy in particular, and medicine. Her publications include a new interpretation of Sophocles' Women of Trachis by reading the text side by side with Hippocratic treatises. Um, uh, she just published a uh, article um, called Heracles Itch, the first case of male uterine displacement in Greek literature in CQ. She is currently co-editing two volumes, one, Body, Medicine, and Latin Poetry under contract with De Gruyter, which explores the intersections between ancient medical theories and Latin poetry, as well as the centrality of the body and its affections in non-medical Roman literary productions. And another volume, Terius Through the Ages, which focus on the reconstruction, transmission, and reception of the myth of Terius in Greece and Rome by examining its different adaptations and their interactions. She is, all, she is also interested in the role of the senses and emotions in Greek and Roman culture, and is currently working on a monograph on the cultural poetics of touch in the ancient world. So Chiara will be giving a talk entitled Beneath the Skin, Investigating Cutaneous Conditions as Somatizations of Gendered Emotions. So please let's welcome her to the stage and hand over the floor to her. Thank you, thank you so much, Eileen. Um, I will try to uh, share my screen. Um, Hopefully it will work. Okay. Would you all see the PowerPoint presentation? Okay. Brilliant. So for onto their heads, she poured the dread itch. For a scabby illness seized hold of all their skin and their hair fell from their heads and their beautiful heads became bold. With these words, Hesiod describes the divine punishment inflicted to the young daughters of Pretus in his catalogue of women, fragment 133, Metal Bath West, whose bodies were horribly marked by skin ailments. A medium between the self and the external world, the skin was deemed to be one of the seats of human emotions in antiquity, and yet its prominent role in ancient literature has so far been overlooked by scholars. Cutaneous conditions were listed among the symptoms of emotional alterations by some of the best known ancient authors spanning from Hesiod to Aeschylus and Plato. In this paper, I will investigate the literary and medical texts where cutaneous conditions appear to be manifestations of emotional alterations. I will begin by analyzing the connection between skin ailments and the feeling of shame. My focus here will be on gendered emotions in particular and the role that the skin played in experiencing, expressing and somatizing gender specific feelings in ancient Greece. I will proceed by examining ancient medical texts with the aim to understand whether the narrative which they provide is consistent with what is found in literary sources. In particular, I will focus on the etiology of cutaneous conditions, including cases of change in complexion and explore the extent to which skin diseases were linked to somatic and mental disorders. Finally, I will show how the exchange of ideas between ancient Greek folklore and medical theories has altered mythological narration on the one hand, but also influenced ancient medical and scientific literature on the other. So the earliest extant work uh, connecting cutaneous diseases and emotions uh, is Hesiod's catalog of women. Fragments 131 to 133, Metal Bequest, focus on the mythological account of the daughters of King Pretus of Argos, the Pretilis, punished by a divinity for committing hubris. More specifically, the god is said to have inflicted on the women a twofold punishment, which consists in lewdness on the one hand, as specified in fragment 132, and cutaneous diseases on the other. Fragment 133 explains the second stage of their suffering with a detailed account of their symptomatology. So in addition to lewdness, which is called uh, machlosiune, 
The prejudice are also said to be punished specifically with regard to their skin. With two cutaneous ailments, Alphos, literally white dull leprosy, and muos, each, further resulting in their boldness. As extensively discussed by Nazari, a wide selection of poets had dealt with myths from Hesiod and Bacchylides to Virgil and Seneca. All authors generally agree on the women being young, but mature enough to get married after committing some form of hubris. They are punished by a god or goddess, Hera in most accounts, with frenzy and forced to leave their house and wander around in wilderness until they are finally healed, while, according to some versions, simultaneously getting married. Variations in the accounts include the identity of the vindictive god, the geographical setting, and the ending of the tale. Although the Hesiodic version of the myth is the only one which includes boldness in the punishment, the relevance of this condition in the myth is also reiterated by iconographic evidence, such as a Sicilian crater from Canicatini, now at the Museo Regionale in Siracusa from the fourth century BCE, where, as I hope you can see, two women are represented visibly bold. Interestingly, Hesiod is the only author to mention the prejudice multiple cutaneous conditions together with their lewdness. This complex clinical picture is mostly simplified in later works under the generic label of madness. The healing process of the young women, however, presupposes a much more intricate situation where ancient religious beliefs and theories of the body are mixed together and which betrays the original complexity of their symptoms. Ancient sources agree on assigning the role of the healer to Melampus, the seer son of Amitheon, although the modality of the healing process differs significantly. If on the one hand, the healing process is described as a religious ritualistic phenomenon, some later accounts of the myth from Theophrastus onwards mention drugs administered to the girl, such as, for instance, the hellebore. Now, this association between the hellebore and the prejudice conditions is of particular interest. This progressive alteration of the myth, I argue, presupposes a treatment of the girl's affections as diseases rather than divine punishments. The hellebore features in ancient Greek medical tradition as a purgative herb recommended for a specific range of illnesses among which mental diseases, but also cutaneous ailments are listed. More specifically, the purgative effect of the hellebore will make it the perfect candidate to deal with humoral imbalances, which will be responsible for both cutaneous conditions and mental derangement. In the Hippocratic Treatise on Epidemics 217, for instance, loss of hair and cutaneous conditions are deemed to be caused by humoral imbalance, whereas in 2614, um, we ascribe both folly and boldness to an excess of bile. So the simultaneous presence of cutaneous and mental diseases uh, is also found at Hathoris 20, where we read that these types of disease tend to affect the patient in spring, which is also text two on the slide. So in spring, occur melancholia, madness, epilepsy, bloody flats, angina, colds, sore throats, coughs, skin eruptions, and diseases, eruptions turning generally to ulcers, tumors, and affections of the joints. This idea seems to be confirmed at Proretic 243, where the cutaneous conditions known as lichen and lepre are said to be caused by black bile. This concept is also reiterated and expanded in Plato's Taineus. According to Plato, skin diseases such as Alphos and Leuke are caused by an excessive presence of phlegm which the body tries to purge by expelling parts of the humor through the skin. If, however, the excessive plague is mixed with black bile, that mixture could cause epilepsy. So the simultaneous presence of skin diseases and emotional and mental derangement in Hesiod's account is particularly remarkable since it refers to an association much prior to humoral medical fields. 
The interpretation of the prejudice symptoms uh, in the catalog of women, I argue, is therefore twofold. On the one hand, the itch which afflicts them is the physical manifestation of their emotional disturbance. Just as their minds are disquieted by erotic obsession, so is their skin by means of the incessant itch which the goddess inflicts upon them. On the other hand, the white dull leprosy and baldness are the visible markers of the shamefulness of their behavior, by which the god stigmatizes their loss of female decency in a visual and immediate manner. So if on the one hand, the prejudice myth that seems to have been progressively influenced by the advancement of ancient Greek medicine. On the other, it also seems to have had in turn an influence on medical literature as well. So the pseudo Hippocratic Lecture 16, for instance, mentions the hellebore as a catharsis inducer and also specifies that its efficacy had been tested by Melampus when he used it to cure the young girls. But more importantly, a strikingly similar symptomatology to that of the prejudice is found in the detailed account of Areteus of Cappadocia, a medical writer who lived in the first, second century CE, on the so-called elephas or elephantiasis, a disease which takes its name from the animal, elephant, either on account of its might or for the aspect of the patient's skin, which resembled that of an elephant. So the elephas consists in a congelation of the inner heat of the patient, which inevitably leads to their death. While at first the disease is difficult to detect, as it primarily affects the internal organs, in the second stage of the ailment, the general appearance of the sufferer is dramatically altered, as we can read text 4a. The hairs on the whole body die prematurely on the hands, the thighs, the legs, and again on the pews. Scanty on the chin, and also the hairs on the head are scarce. And still more frequently, premature hoariness and sudden baldness. The skin of the head deeply cracked, wrinkles frequent, deep, rough, tumors on the face hard, sharp, sometimes white at the top, but more green at the base. And then again, 4B. But if the affection be much raised up from the parts within and appear upon the extremities, lichens occur on the extremities of the fingers. There is pruritus on the knees and the patients rub the itchy parts with pleasure. And the lichen sometimes embraces the chin all around. Finally, for C, appetite for food not amiss, taste indiscriminate, neither food nor drink affords pleasure. Aversion to all things from a painful feeling, atrophy, libidinous desires of a rabid nature. When in such a state, who will not flee? Who will not turn from them, even if a father, a son, or a brother? There is danger also from the communication of the ailment. Many, therefore, have exposed their most beloved relatives in the wilderness and on the mountains, some with the intention of administering to their hunger, but others not so as wishing them to die. The similarity between the symptoms experienced by Hesiod's prejudice and Areteus's description of the elephas is striking. Both accounts list boldness, incessant itch, which results into a cutaneous condition, a lichen in Areteus, and an uncontrollable sexual desire. The recommended therapy described in detail in Areteus's cure for chronic diseases 213 is mainly based on purification by means of bus and hellebore. Even the association with the wilderness where the patients affected by the elephas are often left is another mutual trait. Although Aretel seeks to justify the brutal practice of abandoning them in the wilderness by mentioning the high transmissibility of the disease, he also adds that people close to the diseased flee from them or leave them to die 
due to the impossibility to cope with people in such a state uh, to use their own eontas, whose behavior is described as shameful and unhuman. That Teutonic conditions were linked to shame in ancient Greece is also proven by a passage from Aeschylus's Libation Bearers 278-82, where Orestes describes the punishment which the gods would inflict on him should he fail to avenge the death of his father, as we can read the text five. He revealed the effects of the wrath of hostile powers from under the earth against mortals and spoke of these dreadful afflictions, leprous ulcers attacking the flesh, eating away its pristine appearance with savage jaws, and short white hairs arising on the diseased side. Following his tradition, Aeschylus too considers skin ailments a divine punishment. The Oracle of Apollo warns Orestes about the terrible diseases, Ainas Nosus, which would afflict him should he let his father's homicide go unpunished. As the Oracle reveals, these diseases appear to be a manifestation of the wrath of the wretched souls from the underworld, which Aeschylus represents through the image of leprosy, provided with wild jaws, agriais natus. Interestingly, here too, Skin afflictions are used to convey a shameful emotion. With Leuke, white hairs will grow on Orestes' legends, thus branding his skin as a visible memento of his cowardly disrespect to his dead father. Aeschylus' description of the Leuke is consistent with the Hippocratic account of the disease, as we found in Proretic 2.43, text 6. Lichen, lepra, and leuke, when one of these has arisen in a young person or a child, or when it appears it grows but little over a long time, you must consider the eruption not to be an apostasis, but a disease. Whereas when one of them appears suddenly and over a large area, it is an apostasis. So consistently with what discussed above, the passage explains that cutaneous conditions are caused by humoral imbalance, except when they arise in young children or when their development is low, in which cases they are classified as proper diseases. Now, the case of Orestes will fall under the first category since his skin lesions would arise abruptly and in his adulthood. Even more striking is the similarity between Aeschylus' description of the Leuke's symptoms and the Pseudo-Aristotelian treatise on color 1317, which you can read text seven. So whereas on the one hand, Aeschylus' description of cutaneous conditions pays particular attention to the medical manifestation of the related symptoms, on the other hand, skin lesions are still deemed to be the visible shameful markers of divine punishment consistently with his year. So the prejudice neglected their societal and biological role and are therefore punished with erotic incontinence, which affects their minds and simultaneously brands their beautiful bodies with cutaneous diseases and baldness. Likewise, Apollo warns Orestes that his body will be branded by skin ailments, his punishment for neglecting his filial duty. So both Hesiod and Aeschylus ascribe Titanic's conditions to divine punishment, although the characters' deeds are remarkably different, as strictly linked to their different gendered roles and emotions. Whereas in the case of the young women, their shame is due to an excessive and indecorous sexual behavior, Orestes' main duty is to avenge his father's death. Since their offenses, however, would bring equal shame to them, the punishments devised by the gods include cutaneous conditions in both cases. Now, the link between shame and skin ailments is also found in medical literature, as we read at section 35 of the Hippocratic Treatise on Affections, test eight. So lepre, knismos, psora, lichen, alphos, and alopecis all arise because of phleg. These are signs of shame, ischos, rather than diseases, nosemata. 
The passage capitalizes on the stigmatization of the affected patient and even goes as far as not to consider skin ailments and hair loss proper conditions, but rather signs of shamefulness. The common assumption is that one's aspect mirrors their behavior and character. The smoothness of the skin and general condition of the flesh are also good indicators of one's moral conduct, as we read in a pseudo-Aristotelian treatise on physiognomy, text nine. The physiognomist draws his data from movements and shapes and colors and from habits as appearing in a face, from the growth of hair, from the smoothness of the skin, from voice, from the condition of the flesh, from parts of the body and from the general character of the body. So to conclude, the general picture analyzed above suggests a significant interaction and cross influence between literary text and scientific theories in ancient Greece. In the case of the prejudice, uh, whereas the myth is progressively affected by medical literature, religious and magical remedies featuring in earlier accounts are substituted by medicinal herbs in later ones, it influences scientific texts in turn. A pseudo-Hippocratic Epistle 6, for instance, refers to Melampus when discussing the healing properties of the hellebore and Aratus' description of uh, the Elephas seems to have been modeled on the Asiotic myth. Likewise, the terminology and accurate description of the symptomatology of skin diseases found in Aeschylus proves the circulation of medical ideas at the time of the play. As discussed above, both Hesiod's and Aeschylus's accounts explain skin conditions as divine punishments for shameful behaviors. Although there is no trace of the divine element in medical literature dealing with skin ailments, the connection with the emotional sphere is, however, still vivid in medical texts. Discolored or spoiled skin is considered as a source of shame while simultaneously being the marker of a shameful behavior and dishonorable character. Thank you. Yay, thank you. And Chiara, right on time. <laughs> Anna, that's always awesome. Okay, um, yeah, so let's all kind of uh, clap on. Um, so would anybody like, well, first of all, uh, Chiara, do you feel comfortable um, answering any questions? And Absolutely. does anybody have a, a question to ask Chiara for her very rich talk that looked at a lot of different sources? So I'm just waiting. I guess um, maybe just to start things off, can I ask you a question? Please. So I think, um, you know, when I was listening to your, to your talk, I was really thinking, um, it, I think that you really show the importance of skin as an or, um, as a, as an organ as something to be interpreted. I think um, you know those of us who are working from the Aristotelian tradition tend to kind of think about skin as kind of a lower uh, sense organ. And what you really were showing about how the skin is sort of an, uh, a divine medium of like communication. So I wondered maybe whether you could expand a little bit about how. Um, uh, I know that you're working on a, a project on touch um, about uh, you perhaps sort of reevaluating the significance of uh, touch and skin as a, a sensory organ. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, this very interesting question. Yes. So first of all, uh, I will start by saying that there is much more to say about skin and more specifically its connection with human emotions uh, in antiquity and in ancient Greece in particular than what we would expect. So it's not only the normal touch that will be used uh, to interact with other human beings uh, as we could consider it now. But there is also another aspect uh, that is, uh, uh, again, uh, connected, strictly connected with the emotional sphere. Another element that uh, uh, I didn't have time, unfortunately, to uh, discuss today is, for instance, uh, uh, the one related to each. So if we uh, even briefly compare the um, passage from uh, Ischylus' Catalogue of Women with the one from, sorry, with Ischylus' Catalogue of Women with the one from Ischylus' Libation Bearers, we can see that as a manifestation of a shameful behavior, we have cutaneous ailments in both cases, but the itch is also present in the first one. 
Now, I suppose, uh, um, again, it's something that I said very briefly, uh, that this is linked uh, to the type of emotional alteration that we witness uh, in his youth. So with the prejudice, uh, we have this presence of machlosiune, of lewdness, so this emotional alteration that is translated into terms of erotic incontinence. And each precisely was in ancient Greece, uh, almost consistently, I would say, uh, from uh, uh, very early archaic text, uh, as he said, up to even Hellenistic epigrams, associated with uh, the feeling of desire and, again, erotic emotions. One interesting uh, passage uh, could be found in Plato's uh, Philebus. So Plato used uh, the image of the psora this cutaneous condition, which would be roughly similar to our psoriasis nowadays, to express the um, imbalance between uh, pleasures and pains of the body. And this relief that uh, human beings feel after scratching the itchy parts is compared uh, also to the relief uh, uh, from the erotic experience and encounters. I think this is also consistent uh, um, with what we find in Hippocratic treatises such as uh, on generation one, for instance, when again, the erotic experience is described in terms of uh, itchy feeling and sensation to relief. So this is again, another aspect that would be, I hope, I suppose, uh, interesting to, to investigate. No, it sounds very fascinating. So we have two questions in the chat. So uh, we'll take them. So first Nicolette and then Claire. So please Nicolette, uh, uh, ask your question. Hi, um, thanks so much and thanks for that amazing paper, uh, Chiara. I have a question about gender and skin itself, which might be kind of shooting from the hip a little bit, but thinking about the diseases of women texts and related to the which describe the unique composition of female flesh, what really comes across as how, you know, the sponginess and the porousness of that flesh is not only that which necessita necessitates menstruation, but so often can be um, you know, an area of concern and anxiety where gynecological disease can arise. Um, so I was wondering if the gender nature of skin itself in medicine around this period has come up in your research or, or might have some relevance here, or if it might seem interesting going forward. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, this is a, really a brilliant question. Uh, it's definitely something uh, uh, that I will investigate and will explore further. For now, uh, all I can say is that uh, I suppose that again, the composition, the description of the composition of the complexion and flesh, uh, even more so, that we find in Hippocratic and medical treatises in general, uh, is consistent with uh, these uh, uh, sort of proneness to uh, skin ailments uh, that we see in the cases of women in literature way more often than in men. Another interesting example uh, that comes to my mind now uh, is, for instance, uh, in Theocritus, uh, so talking about a much later text. But there again, the um, description of love sickness in Idle 2 of Simoica is uh, quite consistent with what we find in Isiod. And again, it affects her skin, which is something that at least linked and connected uh, with love sickness we do not find in men. So we have the loss of hair, uh, the limbs that are affected, and something very interesting actually that uh, um, I connected with what you asked me is that uh, the, the actual uh, complexion changes and becomes harder. So this woman affected by love sickness uh, almost loses the main characteristic uh, of uh, female flesh, which is exactly moisture and, uh, and softness. Thank you. Thank you for this question. Thanks. Okay, our last questioner, Claire, do you want to ask your question, please? Hi, thanks, Kara. That was really, really interesting. Um, I was struck by the one passage just that you put in in passing from uh, Hippocrates' affections about um, whether something is a disease or just a sign of shame. Um, and it made me think about kind of the other direction of causality here. You know, we have people who are, they've done something shameful and therefore their skin is going crazy. Um, is there the reverse kind of underlying that, that having some sort of skin disease is in fact a cause of shame and unwillingness to um, interact with society? Is there some internal feeling of shame on these people that is being kind of flipped in that way? Uh, because I've also seen it, I think there's, a, there's actually a textual issue there uh, but there's another, yes. it could also just be disfigurement. Um, exactly. Something then that it's like kind of a, a social handicap. 
Exactly. Thank you. Thank you so much for this. Uh, this is interesting because uh, um, I suppose that there is uh, like a double way of, uh, again, um, influencing uh, from literature to medical text and vice versa. So on the one hand, it's absolutely true. Um, these skin ailments are the source also of the feeling of shame. On the other hand, uh, as uh, I, I hope um, the passage from the physiognomist also showed, physical characteristics are also a sign of uh, moral behavior, moral character that are in a way uh, visible through the features of the body. So I think that if on the one hand, clearly the passage could be read as uh, they are also the sign of a source of shame for this patient, on the other hand, there is also the other correspondence, we see the other way around. So being these skin ailments uh, uh, present in those people are already a sign that these people have something that is showing through. Uh, this is the, the, the most amazing, I would say, um, characteristic uh, that is assigned to the skin, because if we think that through the skin, um, by the action of virus, uh, in literature, of course, but we are also able to fall in love, and so characters are affected directly to their heart through the skin. It is, in a way, a permeable <laughs> organ. So this is the interesting part, that there is a double correspondence from the inside to the uh, outside and vice versa as well. And again, the fact that uh, this element of disfigurement is considered to be, uh, again, this is one of the two possibilities, of course, of the text, but an, as an ice uh, as a shameful sign and manifestation rather than uh, proper nosema, a proper disease. And we find this in medical texts, I think it's also revealing of the way in which they were perceived. And clearly there is something that uh, is still left there from uh, uh, much older times. And clearly, as I said, literary texts uh, have influenced also the medical production and medical texts. All right, uh, thank you so much, Chiara. Let's thank give you. Chiara a what, what, and a, a transition <laughs> to our, our next speaker. So our next speaker is Brent Earhart from the University of Cincinnati. Uh, Brent is a graduate student um, at the University of Cincinnati. He's published an article on the use of stimulative substances in antiquity and contributed select translations to a forthcoming source book of ancient medicine, which I'm very excited to see. His ongoing dissertation focuses on sexual medicine in the imperial age. He also has a majestic orange cat named Rufus of Ephesus, who is prone to interrupting video conferencing. So let's give the floor over to, to Brent. Thank you very much. Uh, can everyone hear me? Oh, that's odd. My My audio seems to not be. Oh, working. sorry. I maybe I was like, uh, I think I was muted the entire time. So, but uh, okay. the floor is yours, Brent. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. All right. Can everybody see this? We can. Okay. The relationship between emotions and the body has remained of perennial interest. Whatever its precise nature, this complicated nexus relates to many important issues, from the mind-body problem to the boundaries of moral behavior. Yet, cultivating the proper relationship between one's suke and soma was not only a philosophical exercise in antiquity, but one that was of interest to medical authors too. For example, the success of reproduction was thought to be influenced by the emotional state of mothers and fathers. Medical authors also turned their gaze towards the effects of sexual activity on the well-being of the suke. In this talk, then, I hope to illustrate an attitude among imperial medical authors that regarded the health of the suke, a slippery term covering both mind and soul, to the health of the body. More specifically, I will focus on the body's reproductive and sexual capacities, which were believed to interact with the mind slash soul in various ways. Because Galen is already receiving attention from several presenters, I draw mostly on other imperial authors of the first few centuries of the common era, who offer relevant, relevant evidence to this, uh, the theme of this panel. I do not mean to suggest that all the authors I discuss were part of a particular medical school, but rather that they share a common willingness to medicalize emotions, or in other words, to understand certain aspects of psychological experiences by using medical thought. 
what we find is not so much a singular theory of the mind-body relationship as a general belief that wellness of the mind and the body are related and therefore must be considered by the doctor in tandem. This conjunctive approach to health regarded reproduction and intercourse as both psychological and a physiological activity. Lastly, in terms of structure, my talk divides into two parts. In part one, the bulk of the talk, I discuss the effects of emotions on reproductive success, whereas in part two, I briefly look at two areas apart from reproduction where sexual activity was thought to have a psychological impact. As anyone who has read through an ancient gynecological text can attest, it is easy to walk away with the impression that reproduction was viewed as a static process. As the usual analogy goes, the man is like a farmer with seed to sow and the woman a field for that seed. But a closer look reveals that there's more to the equation. The doctor's woman can play a dynamic role in the process of reproduction, a process deeply affected by the interactions between her body and emotions. In his famous work on gynecology, Seranus divides the care of pregnant women into three stages. During the first stage of conception, he writes, one must be aware of every excess and change, both bodily and psychic. For the seed is evacuated through fright, sorrow, sudden joy, and generally by severe mental upset. Emotional dangers to conception come first in Seranus's mind, even before the deleterious effects of strenuous exercise. Towards the end of that same chapter, he returns to the woman's role in the third stage of care, namely the perfection of the fetus. Seranus warns that even if the woman is able to break some of the rules without causing a miscarriage, she will still harm her future child's growth, not just in terms of bodily appearance, but of the soul too, which can become ignoble. As he continues, can it be gainsaid that in the case of buildings, a house erected upon solid foundations remains indestructible for a long time, whereas buildings erected upon foundations that are not sound and solid fall down easily and at slight provocation? The construction of living beings is probably not different, except that they are underpinned, as it were, with different first elements and foundations. To this end, if there's any bodily agitation, one must completely remove it, one must appease the soul if the worries of life have troubled it. So in other words, at a certain stage in pregnancy, the woman is no longer a field or a receptacle for seed. She is a builder who, through her own emotions and actions, constructs the future foundations of her offspring's psuche and the quality of that psuche itself. This link between the mother's emotional capacity or emotional experiences in the development of the fetus, both somatic and psychic, was widely taken for granted in antiquity and perhaps nowhere more apparent than in the theory of maternal impressionism. Per this theory, what a woman sees during intercourse directly affects the external appearance of her offspring and also their uh, internal soul. Seranus claims uh, that women that have seen a monkey in Koitu have been bo have born, uh, given birth to children who resemble monkeys. Uh, according or accepting the uh, validity of this process, Seranus incorporates it into his advice for pregnant women, as you can see exhorting them to protect the fetus's soul from strange fantasies by refraining from drinking before procreating. Elsewhere, Saranus provides uh, some further examples of how the mother's experiences can pose a risk to reproductive success, which I, will not, uh, I, will put, I won't put all of them up on the screen. Well, when it comes to recognizing the signs of a fertile woman, woman, he links good digestion with a calm and cheerful disposition. Chronic indigestion can create inner turbulence that results in miscarriage. In general, the woman needs to be in good spirits, especially at the time of intercourse, when her desire must be present for conception to take place. Furthermore, women who experience pica have to be denied their newfangled desires, which might be harmful to the fetus, but not indefinitely so. As Seranus explains, if after a few days, a woman with pica uh, does not get what she wants, then in her despondent state of the soul, uh, her body will shrink. So Seranus views women as pivotal characters in the reproductive process whose emotions can have dangerous consequences reaching beyond the confines of their own minds. Their subjective experiences can not only harm their own bodies, but the developing body and soul of their child in utero. At the same time, however, reproduction was a two-way street involving more than just the woman. We do find some glimpses into the male's role uh, beyond the pages of Seranus. From Athenaeus of Italia, perhaps writing in the first century CE, we have a fragment on preparing for procreation. Athenaeus highlights the importance of balancing mental and physical well being. He writes that people who are going to procreate should be in their best condition in terms of both their mind and body. That is, they should have a steady mind that is not restrained by grievances, anxieties, in addition to physical pains or any other affection, and their bodies should be healthy and generally not deficient. 
He goes on in this chapter to point out that unhealthy products come not from stable and healthy bodies, but sick ones, hence the importance of regimen. In the ancient paradigm of reproduction, the male body has a duty to produce and perfect seed through various internal processes. But instead of three stages, that, instead of three stages of care, the man has to focus on preparations prior to conception. Yet Athenaeus' remarks about the presence of desire draws an interesting parallel between the experiences of men and women. Athenaeus calls for there to be a burning desire, signified with the verb kaya. Uh, this intense emotion is also necessary for the woman if conception is to take place as Serranus held. Rufus of Ephesus, likely a contemporary of Serranus and Athenaeus, also conforms, uh, confirms the importance of desire when it comes to intercourse. He writes, uh, it is best for every man uh, to have intercourse when he is eager in his mind and body and for him to overcome matters of the mind and to serve his body. In Rufus's professional opinion, successful intercourse required one to get their mind and body on the same page then. Another fragment of Rufus, though not necessarily dedicated to procreation, advises sexually active people to avoid strong emotions such as anger, grief, and even joy before intercourse. What we would find between Serranus, Athenaeus, and Rufus then is a conjunctive approach in which certain psychological experiences have to be monitored for their physical consequences. Hence, men also had to optimize their bodies for reproductive success by paying careful attention to their mental states, because uh, these can adversely affect the health of their future offspring, if not their own health. There was another role that uh, men could play when it came to procreation. To increase the chances of success, he not only had to monitor his own experiences, but his partners as well. Aetis of Amida preserves a chapter from an unspecified source on the causes of infertility, in which he brings up the subject of volition. The obstacle preventing pregnancy could also be the use of force and a woman copulating with a man when she is unwilling. The woman's being in agreement, hey, I got posa, is fitting for generation. And for this reason, copulating with passion, met erotas, is, uh, produces children the quickest. Unlike Serranus, who infamously suggests that women can enjoy sex enough to conceive even if they are raped, this passage points to a different perspective on the importance of consent. As Etius literally writes, a loving woman is ideal. In this case then, the cultivation of mutual affection was not something to be overlooked by men, and the more passion between the couple, the better. The importance of a woman's volition is also echoed in a passage of the Eunychia, which seems to be an epitome of a lost work by Caelius Aurelianus with additions drawn from Muthio. Here, it is pointed out that affections or passiones of the mind can induce the body to create obstacles to reproduction. Accordingly, as he says, the woman should, quote, not rush into sexual activity in such a way that she still appears to be mentally suffering, and though offering herself, copulates disagreeably. Whether this information originally came from Serranus is unclear, but it is a reminder that late antique medicine, once viewed as uninteresting, still holds surprises. This interest uh, in the effects of coercion on a woman's psychological state seems to stand out from Hippocratic gynecology where impediments to reproduction tend to be mechanically explained while the subjective experiences of women are muted. However, developments in post-Hippocratic gynecology could form a talk of its own. So I'll leave the topic of reproduction behind and move on to the second half in which I briefly discuss some psychological effects of sexual activity. As we have seen, the interest that medical authors had in sexual activity and emotions can be described as pronatalist, but it would be unfair to characterize their interests exclusively as such. Sexual activity was a regular constituent of regimen, regardless of whether it was undertaken with reproductive intent. Medical discussions of sexual activity tend to focus on its physical effects on the body, such as drying or moistening or loosening it. However, Athenaeus of Italia provides an example of concern for the effects that sexual activity could have on the soul and body simultaneously. In one fragment, Athenaeus gives advice on the education of teenage boys during their formative years. From the ages of 14 to 21, Athenais recommends that teenage boys not only increase their study of mathematics and philosophy, but also avoid the excessive sexual activity that their newfound impulses from puberty would have them undertake. Thus, Athenais writes, nothing is as destructive to the development of the soul and the body as untimely and profuse engagement in sexual activity. Athenais does not give many details as to why this is the case, but it may be based on similar logic to a passage found in Aristotle's History of Animals, where Aristotle explains that 
excessive sexual activity at a young age uh, alters the internal movement of fluids and creates a, a cycle of impulses. So in essence, the fear about a lot of sexual activity at a young age seems to be that it alters the body and mind together by creating a, a nasty sort of feedback loop. Anything in excess could be bad, even if the excessive impulses are a natural part of human development. It would be difficult to construct Athanasius' theories about the relationship between Sufi and Soma on the basis of this passage alone, but at the very least, it speaks to a belief in some continuity between the two. The body is not a passive container. Its physical activities can affect the soul's development, a topic which should typically belong to the domain of philosophers, but which Athanasius regarded as fair game for doctors, as Sean Coughlin has recently argued. Athanasius seems to have gone one step further than Saranus, who took a medical interest in the soul, but in, in a passage uh, uh, not discussed previously, um, dismissed pedagogy as a topic for philosophers to debate. So finally, another area where doctors seem to have taken interest in the relationship between sexual activity and emotions was in cases of male sexual dysfunction. Only a few passing statements on the matter have survived as excerpts in the late medical encyclopedias. The relationship between these excerpts remains unclear, but for reasons I don't have time to lay out, it is probable that they come from one or more authors writing between the second and fourth century CE. These passages reveal an interest in the emotional consequences of sexual dysfunction. Uh, Paul of uh, Agina uh, uh, briefly discuss or describes the symptoms of dysfunction in a chapter devoted to a proctomoria, literally non-functioning genitals. As Paul writes, People who have this affection are not eager for sexual activity, and because of that, they become despondent, a thumor. One would like to know more, but Paul only focuses on the physical aspects of the problem. He attributes the dysfunction either to paralysis or deficiency of seed, and then proceeds to list herbal remedies, which I haven't listed. Presumably, the tsuke will be treated along with the soma. One more passage worth mentioning is from the Byzantine compilation of Paul of Nicaea. Paul of Nicaea describes the dysfunction in more gendered terms. As he writes, if these patients are not able to finish their manly duties, taton andron erga, they are destroyed by shame and grief. This passage shows an interest in male patient sensitivities, which are informed not only by their personal expectations of performance, but also societal expectations of what it meant to be a man. The doctor's analysis of well being could thus consider the, the psychological and sociological tolls experienced by patients. The implicit goal of treatment was not only to restore their sexual functions, but their sense of wholeness, which has been compromised by their body's inability to accomplish what their mind expects it to do. In the interest of time, I will now move to conclude. I've tried to show how the body's sexual functions were related to emotional well being in imperial medical thought. For the authors I've surveyed, certain emotions were not only subjective, but uh, also physiological experiences with the potential to alter mind and body alike whether during gestation or intercourse itself. Ultimately, this conjunctive approach to well-being in which uh, physical constitution and emotional disposition were both important to the doctor fit into a larger program of striving for balance. Thus, this talk offers just one example of how further study of the medicalization of emotions can provide us with a more robust understanding of ancient medicine as an all-encompassing practice. Thank you, Brent, so much uh, for that uh, very, uh, uh, very well organized talk. And I apologize for uh, being uh, muted when I was introducing you, but let's all kind of give a digital clap, a little hand clap here for Brent. Uh, we have uh, um, some time for questions. Um, so I wanna open the floor out if you feel comfortable, Brent, for uh, receiving questions. Uh, um, but, um, Oh, yes, yeah, so just the chat. Somebody talk about them. So maybe um, while people are formulating their their questions, might I? Um, okay, well, somebody else has a question, so maybe um, I will hold my question after uh, uh, giving priority to uh, Michelle. Uh, would Michelle, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question, please? Yes. Thank you for your very interesting talk, Brent. I was thinking as you discussed the emotions of the parents and their effects on the offspring, whether any of the consequences discussed might play into the natural character that uh, was discussed in the earlier talk with Ralph Rosen. 
I'm sorry. Whether the primary consequence is just miscarriage. Could you repeat? I'm sorry. I was having trouble with my audio. Oh, certainly. I was wondering whether one of the consequences of the parental emotion would be an effect on the natural character of the offspring or whether the primary issue would just be miscarriage that they were trying to prevent. Oh, yes, I see. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that there's a, there's a concern um, for, for character and for the, the, um, how the, uh, the, the future child will grow up. Um, Saranis uh, mentions, he uses the, uh, I don't recall the Greek word, but he talks about how um, the, the actions will, will uh, not only, you know, disform f physically the, the fetus, but uh, also uh, make it ignoble, uh, which is kind of a charged word. So um, it, it does seem that uh, Saranis has an interest in, in um, the character of, of the future uh, child or, or fetus or whatever uh, you want to, uh, words he uses uh, for it. Um, but he, uh, he, he seems to also kind of be hesitant to um, be very specific about pedagogy, about saying, you know, this is what you do to the child at this age and at that age. Okay, great. Thank you so much. So I see two questions in the chat function. So we'll have uh, Simona go first and then Rebecca. So please, uh, Simona, do you mind unmuting and asking your question? Yes, thank you. Thank you for your talk. I really enjoyed that. Uh, so I apologize in advance uh, if this question uh, comes from another angle. Uh, some time ago, I was looking at how ancient medical writings remarked that pregnancy symptoms, uh, or I mean, to put it better, conditions during pregnancy can change depending on whether a woman is pregnant with a male or a female child. What I cannot recall now is whether and how emotions come into play in determining the gender of the fetus or conversely, how the gender of the fetus affects the woman's emotions. I don't know, have you found anything about that? I'm, I mean, I'm pretty interested in this question of the, term, of the determination of the gender of the child. Um, yes, there, there is material on that. Um, and if you uh, uh, private message me, um, I, can, I can email you some, some, some passages. I don't recall the um, I don't recall if emotions are, are in it. Um, I'm Saranis has a discussion. Um, he's skeptical, but he talks he, he links um, whether the fetus is going to be male or female based off of um, uh, you know whether you feel it on the right or left side of your body or whether it's uh, it moves more um, or whether it's warmer or colder. Um, and he seems more skeptical. He cites earlier views, but you can find um, people like um, Vindicianis who uh, accept these views and uh, say, no, they, um, you know, this is how you'll tell whether it's a male or female uh, based off of what it does to the mother. Um, but I can't recall if emotions are, uh, you know, if, for example, if they, if they say something like, uh, oh, if it's a female child, the mother will be more upset, or if it's a male child, the mother will be more stern. I wouldn't be surprised if, if there's something like that, but I, I can't recall off the top of my head. Um, but I'll, I definitely would, will um, message you um, the, some passages to look at if you're interested. Great, thank you so much. So Rebecca, do you wanna come forward and ask your question, please? Yes, certainly, thank you very much. And um, thank you very much for the, um, the, the paper. I was, I was just going to pick up on the sort of final point you're making that in a sense, this all fits into um, wider patterns about balance and um, uh, it, it, I was, sort of interested as to whether you would say that this is kind of working through the intersection between kind of emotion, physiology, sexuality and health in ways that we'd expect. So is this, is this given what we know about the broad patterns of um, ancient medicine, is this roughly what we'd expect or are there things that you found more kind of surprising or that seem more contradictory um, or sort of challenging within those models? Um, so some of it was was uh, things that um, that I expected. Um, one of the things that um, I that uh, threw me off a little and was was interesting was the the remark by um, uh, Etius and also by um, uh, uh, well I guess Tylius Aurelian slash Mustio um, about the the woman's um, uh, state of consent, um, which Saranus seems to just disregard and not think is very important. Um, and I think it would be. I, I'm curious if, if Kylie's uh, uh, view on that is his own, um, or if he's uh, translating something of uh, Saranus's that um, 
you know, doesn't survive to us because it would be kind. Of, it would be interesting to try and figure out how to balance those in, in Theronis's thought. Um, but at the same time, I'm challenged because I I don't want to read into it a, a sort of um, modern uh, sex positivity. You know, both people are are, are, are equal because we we know that the androcentric views of, of medical authors are you know. They, they definitely, uh, as you've already been in uh, your, your monograph uh, some 20 years ago, uh, they, they definitely uh, uh, treat women as, as inferior. So uh, that was one of the things that uh, maybe I could dig a little bit more. Um, I'm not sure if it's just kind of a one-off thing or if it, it reflects some sort of post-Hippocratic development um, in terms of caring a little bit more about the, the woman's uh, psychological state. Are there any other questions that uh, anybody would like to ask uh, Brent? I guess um, just to uh, piggyback on what you were just talking about, that issue about uh, consent, you know, that was something that I found very, very fascinating. And I was just wondering whether there was any uh, um, social reasons why there might be uh, a, a change in um, uh, these uh, views about consent. So there was, this was something that I found uh, very striking too as well. But, you know, perhaps, you know, um, you don't have to answer that because I do want to prioritize uh, people in the questions. So uh, uh, maybe you can come back to that later. But Stephanie, do you want to unmute yourself and uh, ask your question, please? Sorry, I feel sheepish about now cutting into your question. Oh, don't, please, please. I'd rather <laughs> prioritize people in the question, uh, uh, the question and answer. Well, Brent, thank you very much for your talk. This was interesting to me in part because this material is really new to me and I haven't read the authors that you surveyed. Um, and I was wondering because you did just select some great examples from a variety of authors, if you have noticed across this body of text, whether there is a um, difference in the, the, the core problem with that they're trying to address. So when um, and any of the authors are talking about are sort of outlining why we want to have these calm emotions and why women should regulate or men should regulate what they do for the purposes of procreation. Um, is there a difference, like are some authors more interested in like the just like the practical outcome of getting a healthy child and whereas are others more interested in say like some kind of like the platonic virtue that's exhibited in this act if that makes sense uh yeah um so some authors seem to be more interested in um the well not more interested they seem to also be interested in uh the, the moral outcome or the ethical outcome of, of you know what the child would be like um for Saranus, it's a little, I mean, it's hard because, you know, he's writing his gynecology and clearly most of what he says has to be read in the, uh, in light of, he wants, he wants successful, uh, you know, reproduction. He wants to make sure that there's no miscarriage. He does seem to be interested in, in the, the, the soul of the child. Um, and I, I imagine we would, we would know more if his work on the soul survived, um, but it, it doesn't. Um, Athenaeus seems to really be interested in, in uh, the pedagogical aspects of, of, of raising a good child and what, what effects does sexual activity have on uh, them. And um, I, I'm not an expert on Athenaeus, but I, I, uh, I wonder if, it's, if he's picking up something that uh, Aristotle kind of just threw out in uh, piecemeal. Aristotle throws out um, ideas about whether sexual activity could be not sort of ethically bad for you, but what it does to your body and what, what, what it'll do to you in the future when you're young. And he just kind of throws these things out in the, in the history of animals. He makes some comments in the politics, but he never fleshes it out. So I'm wondering if it's, it's um, it, there's, there's something going on in imperial medicine where, uh, where doctors are, are feeling more comfortable taking up this sort of philosophical uh, uh, outlook on um, how to raise a child, what the child should be like, and what their role as, as manipulators of the body, as doctors, uh, would be with that. I hope that answers your question. I'm sorry. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Brent, for uh, for this very rich talk. Um, I must say I'm a little bit disappointed that your cat, Rufus of Ephesus, has not appeared. <laughs> I was kind of waiting for that. Uh, but uh, thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> uh, so let's give another ra round of applause. I'll give a little golf clap uh, to Brent and let's move on to our next speaker.
So our next speaker is Andrew Mayo, one of University of Michigan's own. So Andrew Mayo is a third year PhD student in classical studies and philosophy at the University of Michigan. His main interests are in Hellenistic philosophy and in ancient science and secondary interests include ancient literary criticism, allegoresis and tragedy. He's doing preliminary work at the present on his dissertation dealing with analogical reasoning and Hellenistic and early imperial philosophy and science. So let's give a round of applause to Andrew and give him the floor. So, yay. So please, uh, Andrew, take it away. Thanks for that introduction. Um, let me know if my audio is not working. I'm just going to try to share. My presentation should be in the chat, but let me, uh, my um, handout. Let's see. Can you see my handout here? All right. Uh, so I think yeah, this I'm talking about some of the same questions Professor Rosen did, but from a somewhat different angle. So I hope that works well. Um, okay. So uh, Galen certainly took on numerous theoretical commitments in the course of his work. Uh, the soul is tripartite, as Plato maintained, um, and at the same time, the rational soul is the governing part of the soul that is responsible for all thought and voluntary movement. Contrary to cardiocentrists like Aristotle and Praxagoras, we know from the structure of the nervous system that the ruling part of the soul cannot be located in the heart and must reside in the brain. Yet at the same time, unlike the Stoics, Galen relies on the partition of the soul to explain contrary impulses within the soul. While Galen's um, polemic against Stoic psychology requires that the rational soul be the cause of our actions, the explanatory role of the Platonic partition demands that the spirited and appetitive parts of the soul be responsible for a great many of most people's actions. Um, so with Galen as with Plato, but the rational part is the ruling part of the soul. Its rule is not absolute, and its power would seem often to be overcome by that of the irrational parts. The long-standing puzzle in scholarly literature concerns the question how Galen's physiology, with all sensation and action referred to the brain, can be reconciled with this broadly platonic psychology. And indeed, a great deal of progress has been made in this regard, in particular with Yulia Tompete's recent papers on Galen's uh, psychology and physiology, 2016 and 2018. My proposal is that there are two systems in the human soul for action, according to Galen, and both systems involve the rational soul. The first system we share with animals and with young children, uh, it involves the rational soul in that it requires sensation, representations, and memory in order to produce voluntary motion. And then there is a second system according to which we deliberate consciously and act on the basis of such deliberation. The first system is in a sense more fundamental. We have it in the cradle. We are more readily moved to action by it and the emotions are central to it. The second system is what is uniquely human and depends on reason in a more narrow sense. Uh, Christopher Gill has argued that Galen in works like On the Doctrines of Hippocrates and Plato moves towards a more unified conception of the soul that's governed by the brain and therefore is in some important ways philosophically more in agreement with the Stoics and with Plato. While this is doubtless true in some respects, I think it is very important the complexity of the brain allows for multiple contrary relationships, relationships with other parts of the body and that this allows Galen to preserve some of the pluralistic side of Platonic psychology. Uh, if we imagine Plato's mind to be a ghost in a machine, and I don't mean to draw on the full implications of that phrase, but uh, my argument is that Galen's mind, in the narrow sense of conscious thought, is not merely a ghost in a machine. The mind is, as it were, a ghost within a machine within a further machine. Uh, the mind arises out of the rational soul residing in the brain, and the material constitution of the brain must determine what can and cannot do. I'll say a little bit more uh, about this at the end of the paper. Um, all right, so uh, whatever Galen's model of the causal interrelations relation between soul and body, they must fit within his understanding of the structure of the body. Anatomy and physiology are then central, so I turn to the nervous system and brain first. Uh, in some sense, Galen's account of liver and heart as seats of emotion, um, these organs are responsible for actions of the body. Uh, though some scholars have complained the absence of motor nerves proceeding from liver and heart undercuts this, Lorraine and Tilleman have suggested that Galen sees emotions in these organs as influencing the brain and thereby affecting actions transitively. Uh, one key passage in this connection is from a disputed passage, but Eileen has recently defended the uh, probable authenticity of it. Um, this is item one on the handout. Um, so in, so um, Galen took great pride in his anatomical work on the brain and speaks at length about the division between the cerebrum and cerebellum. Um, Galen thinks it is physically necessary for the 
uh, parts of the brain that is primarily concerned with higher cognitive functions. Um, the cerebrum to be distinct from the part of the brain that is more responsible for initiating action, the cerebellum. And this is item two on the handout here. Um, hard matter is more suitable for active function, while soft is more suitable for passive function, as is necessary, or passive um, events, I guess, as necessary in sense perception, uh, sense perception being fundamentally passive. The brain is the seat of the rational soul, but its functions are divided within it. Uh, neither cerebrum nor cerebellum could count as the seat of the rational soul on its own. The rational soul is that which is responsible for sensation and for initiating voluntary motion. The soft tissue of the cerebrum allows for alteration, uh, and it is this that allows for memory, thought, representation, and all higher cognitive function. It is the hard tissue of the cerebellum, on the other hand, that is most directly responsible for our movements and actions. The cerebellum can initiate some actions on its own, but in line with Stoke psychology, Voluntary action generally requires fantasia, mental representation, as well as form A, impulse or effort. Our normal activity will involve communication between the two parts, and this communication will happen by way of the ventricles of the brain. Um, and here's a quick image there. That's, I believe that's actually of an ox brain uh, from Walker's book. Um, Galen seems to attach great importance to the intercommunication of the ventricles, uh, which allows for the passage of psychic pneuma. Galen emphasizes as well uh, the importance of the passage of psychic pneuma between the cerebrum, cere cerebrum and cerebellum. In book one of On the Usefulness of Parts, Galen associates the role of the fourth ventricle in communicating <clears throat> psychic pneuma from the cerebrum to the cerebellum with the an anatomical observation that motor nerves originate from the brain. Uh, and here is that passage, item three. Uh, the size of the passage for psychic pneuma is clearly important here since it is the sole means of communication between cerebrum and cerebellum. The main function of the ventricles of the brain is to produce psychic pneuma out of vital pneuma and transmit the psychic pneuma through the brain, as Julius Rocca has shown. Remarks in On the Affected Parts tell us more about the consequences uh, of, um, of damage to the ventricles. Pressure on the ventricles decreases the tension, tonos, of the psychic pneuma in the brain, which leads to a stupor, stupor karos, most of all in the case of the middle ventricle. Um, and this is uh, items five and six here. Um, perhaps because of the third ventricle's role in communicating psychic pneuma between cerebrum and cerebellum. Elsewhere in the same treatise, he mentions that harm is done to the mind, dianoia, when trepanation puts pressure on the brain. Uh, on Walker's interpretation, the general effect of such pressure to the brain, at least in this treatise, has mainly to do with the ventricles and psychic pneuma in them. Uh, mind seems to be something that arises from the communication of different parts of the brain. At the same time, Galen does seem to think of damage to the cerebrum as more associated with damage to the functions of the mind. Dionoeticae ah, energiae. Um, the upshot of all this, I think, is that what we might call mind is something very sensitive to changes in the tension of the psychic pneuma in the brain, um, which any pressure applied to the ventricles affects, and mind is especially associated with the cerebrum. The mind emerges out of the coordination of several parts, uh, and the actions of mind are something more complex still. Galen associates the effects of damage uh, to the ventricles with the impairment of the mind. And this uh, tells us something about the way in which mind is, as it were, superimposed on a basic, more basic structure. Um, that the mind is the cause of things external to the brain via the cerebellum by means of this tension or tonus of the soul, whatever that is, uh, by a sort of disposition of the whole soul for which the spirited part in the heart is chiefly responsible. Uh, Julia Trompeta has contributed a great deal recently, particularly the 2016 article, to understanding the role of the soul's tension in Galen's psychology, which owes much to the Stoics. Uh, the soul's tension is an intrinsic function of the heart, as we have it in item nine on the handout here, among the doctrines of Hippocrates and Plato. Uh, a stronger heart, in virtue of the greater tension of the soul, will be more able to support the rational soul. The inner heat of the body gives rise to the tension of the soul, but it's not simply to be identified with it, as uh, Trompita has shown. Uh, the, this heat is a product of the left ventricle of the heart and the vital pneuma. In psychological terms, the idea seems to be that in the absence of a soul that is properly unified in virtue of its tension, the consequence of this is feebleness and general inability to act, as well as an increased susceptibility to some strong passions. Um, pain and bodily desire in particular can be felt more intensely in the case of a weak vital tension, uh, zotikos tonos. 
In such instances, without the strong influence of the heart, the brain simply receives and is passively acted on by the passions of the appetitive soul. It appears that the activities of the appetitive part are more diffusely registered by the nervous system and so not dependent on the functional unity of the whole soul. At the same time, the heart not maintaining an adequate tension brings about feebleness and incapacity in action. This comes up variously, but one instance is item 11 here uh, from, on the doctrines of Hippocrates and Plato. Uh, Galen uses Chrysippus' example of Menelaus as described in Euripides and Andromache. In the illustration, at least, Menelaus' judgment is to kill Helen, but his resolve is undercut by the weakness of his soul, which Galen identifies with the weak tension of his soul. Uh, the psychic pneuma is the instrument by which the parts of the brain, uh, with the parts of the brain communicate and are able to bring about action. It seems reasonable to suppose that much of the effect of a weak heart on the causal efficacy of the brain has to do with the connection between the tonos of the soul and the regulation of vital pneuma by the heart on the one hand, and the production of psychic pneuma out of vital pneuma by the ventricles of the brain on the other. Failures from such a deficiency of the tension of the soul are, I think, failures of the first system I have described, the system, you know, this emotional system. Uh, but the unifying function of the tonus of the soul and coordinating action does not always mean obedience to the dictates of rational thought. Galen's example of the great hearted individual acting contrary to her deliberative preference is the Medea of Euripides. Her actions follow her through Moss and she kills her children, even though she actively and consciously believes she should not. Um, this sort of failure is distinctly a failure of the second conscious system of the soul. Uh, all right. Emotions like anger and desire are both active functions of the irrational soul and passive affections of other parts, as Galen makes clear at the beginning of book six on the doctrines of Hippocrates and Plato. Uh, the same event is describable in either terms, the impulse of anger arising in the heart being an energeia of the heart, but a pathema, an affection of the rest of the body, including the rational part. There is then one straightforward way in which we might have a causal chain running from the irrational soul to the rational soul in the brain, and thence via the cerebellum and nervous system to whatever parts of the body uh, are to carry out the action. Uh, with item uh, 14 on the handout, uh, a passage from the Surviving Arabic Summary of On Character Trade, which was also um, a work also very important in Professor Rosen's talk, um, Galen seems to imply that, that what the rational soul does on its own is a relatively narrow subset of actions. Um, the next item, a passage from On the Doctrines of Hippocrates and Plato, uh, item 15, is relevant in this connection. Uh, on this model, the model seems to be presented here, reason develops gradually. Young children, though mostly irrational, nevertheless engage in an extremely wide range of seemingly deliberate actions. Galen describes children as living by feeling or by affection, katapathos zonta. It makes sense that adults should retain the structure of action found in children. Um, and there's some for the support I have included here for that in uh, on character traits, de moribus. Um, but then also item 16 helps us here. Um, here we seem to have it that the function of the rational soul includes at least four faculties or powers, namely sensation, imagination or mental representation, memory and deliberation. The intellect, which I take in a sense of conscious rational thought, stands to the rational soul as the eye to the body. This passage suggests as well, that the faculty of rational deliberation depends on the faculties of sensation, memory and representation. And in the first place consists in observing similarity and difference. This makes good sense since Galen tells us these faculties must be developmentally prior in humans. It would accord well in this case that they should also be physiologically more fundamental. Um, and there are some added complexities here that I don't quite have time to get into. Um, but noteworthy in this connection are the two senses of voluntary motion in Galen that are observed by Trompeta in her 2018 paper. Sometimes Galen means by this voluntary motion, simply motion that is initiated by the brain, whereas the pulse, for instance, is regulated by the heart independently of the brain. Um, at other times, voluntary motion refers to motions that result from rational deliberation. I think that these two conceptions of voluntary motion have much to do with the two systems that I have described. Children are very capable of voluntary motion in the first sense, you know, any motion initiated by the brain, but less capable of voluntary motion in the second sense, conscious, deliberate action. Um, 
the emotions are a much more essential part of the first system than the thoughts of the mind are. This comes out in the passage dealing with acrasia, this is item 16 on the handout here. Weakness of will, that is. Um, here, the passions of the irrational soul predominate. In some cases, reason go, going along willingly and conforming its opinions to the guiding passions. And in other cases, reason is unwilling, but the rational soul is nevertheless pulled, into pulled along into carrying out the action. In the first sort of case, where rational thought is guided, but not necessarily uh, circumvented by the irrational passions, it is not clear what the ca causal role of conscious deliberation will be. And I'm not entirely sure how to understand this. Um, but in the latter case, which Galen designates as a cratic, it is very much, it very much seems that the mind does not play a causal role. When it comes to acratic actions, the conscious deliberative mind is a mere hanger on of the causal chain of first system action. There are, I think, two ways in which the uh, conscious mind can more or less immediately affect its will. It can do so simply by means of the cerebe cerebellum um, and the soul's tension, or else by triggering emotional responses by way of mental representations. For longer term goals, the mind can also set about altering the intrinsic and relative characteristics of different parts of the soul, as Galen makes clear in the Diagnosis and Cure of the Soul's Passions, uh, the Ethical Treatise. Simply resolving to be free of one's anger does not make it so, uh, as we see in item 17, and probably as we all know in our own right. Uh, Galen's position in the treatise seems to be that, though we cannot resolve at once to eliminate excessive emotion, there must surely be some aspects in which it is in our power to act on anger less often. The more our actions indulge a passion, it seems, the more they modify the disposition of the organs of the irrational soul, such that the passion is more intense in the future. Likewise, if fewer actions indulge a given passion, passion uh, the organs will be less disposed towards causing that passion in the future. Later, Galen clarifies uh, that the spirited part of the soul uh, ought to be trained so as to be obedient to the rational part and so to be its instrument in action. Uh, further, aside from training the spirited soul to obey rational judgment, one should also constrain its strength. Uh, since if the spirited part of the soul becomes too strong, will necessarily be able to overpower judgment. The appetitive part of the soul, on the other hand, should simply be weakened as much as possible. And this is an interesting part. Uh, Galen maintains that obedience is a disposition of the spirited soul distinct from its degree of strength, uh, though a very strong soul cannot really be fully obedient. Where, uh, whereas if the appetitive soul yields, this is necessarily in virtue of its weakness. This is item 19. Um, it would seem then that the physical dispositions of the spirit and the appetitive parts at any given moment determine what conscious deliberate actions are possible. That is to say, they determine what scope of action the second system has. These dispositions also determine what passions occur and to what extent the passions arising in the irrational parts of the soul and registered as representations in the cerebrum can irresistibly cause actions. Galen mentions as well that for the majority of individuals, the parts of the soul are so disposed that the passions are incurable diseases. And this is item 20. In other words, most of us are subject to very many emotions of such a character as to leave our minds no possibility of resisting them, nor of weakening them. Uh, all right, so I need to skip over some material here for reasons of time. Uh, moving on to the conclusion. Uh, the two central and related points I tried to argue for here are firstly that the rational soul in the brain is not simply um, um, is not simply uh, is not a simple unity, um, and secondly that there are in effect two systems of action available to the human soul. The first system is the more immediate one, is governed by the emotions, and is most of us is the predominant one. The brain tends to be more responsive to it, and we share the basic machinery of it with both animals and young children. In physical terms, the second system of action emerges gradually as we grow up uh, out of the interrelations between different parts of the brain via the second pneuma in the, in the ventricles, and it is easily impaired by mechanical failures of brain and pneuma. In mental terms, the faculty of mind or conscious thought is developmentally and physiologically posterior to the other cognitive faculties. The scope of action for the second system is greatly conditioned by the power of the first system. A good illustration of the distinctness of the two systems comes in analogies Galen uses to describe the mind situation. In item 16, um, oh, in item 16, we have um, encountered 
the analogy of the mind in relation to the national soul as being like the eye in relation to the body. Here I want to bring in closing, bring up in closing an analogy from On the Doctrines of Hippocrates and Plato. Um, um, and that's oh okay, uh, that's from um, book four. Um, when a, so in this analogy, when a runner runs downhill, the motion of the body may continue after the runner's effort ends, since an external force is present. Their original downward motion is a compound of the internal effort and the external force. Likewise, with reason and the emotional drives, actions undertaken deliberately are a compound of the mind's resolution and the work of the emotions arising externally to the mind. On this analogy, the first system of action would be like a rock rolling down a hill, straightforwardly determinate. This is the sense in which what I, this is in the sense in which I meant it, that the mind is a ghost within two machines. Uh, there, there is the mind within the machine that consists of the brain ruled in large measure by sensation and emotion, out of which the mind is only scarcely able to emerge. And then there is the mind within the broader machine of the rest of the body. The core of the complexity here has to do with Galen's resistance to drawing too sharp a, distinct, a distinction between mind and body. I've argued for the distinctness of the two systems, but in fact, actions of, actions of the second system will generally be a perplexing uh, compound of both systems. Um, just like the runner rushing headlong downhill. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, so much for that very careful talk and very uh, rich talk too as well. Um, so I'd like to open the floor for, for questions if you feel comfortable uh, fielding them, Andrew. Sure. So uh, please, yeah, so let's, let's clap, yeah, <laughs> too as well. Um, so please, uh, anyone uh, answer that? I, I guess things to get things going. Um, I guess I, I will ask you um, something if you if you don't mind. Um, I thought it was really interesting this um, this uh, point that you're making in conclusion about uh, Galen sort of committed to uh, you know creating a distinction between the mind and the body, but then again it gets complicated. What as a doctor does Galen get out of uh, keeping the uh, or is keeping a divide uh, between mind and body? Um, so could you talk a little bit about uh, why um, he might uh, feel, uh, yeah, like what, what as a doctor he gets out of keeping them separate? Because that, that often thinks of a philosophical move uh, for a, a philosopher to be able to separate the two to claim uh, expertise, uh, stronger over expertise and control of the other. Yeah, so thanks for that. Um, in the in the uh, fuller version of this, I, I would have addressed the uh, loose ends uh, I thought there were, and those loose ends are very much around well teleology on the hand, but then also around the medical the uh, medical applications of this. I was wondering, one part of it is I think you should be able to analyze the um, passions, intense passions, you know, with the causal framework of disease that Galen uses, containing cause and antecedent causes, but more particularly. I looked a little bit at the at um, uh, a couple of you know clinical anecdotes in uh, on prognosis, but not enough to really get a good sense for this. Um, Singer, in one of the papers in the bibliography, does talk a bit about how Galen is relatively uninterested in therapy for um, really severe case, uh, severe cases of psychological distress. Um, one possible upshot of this, but this is this is kind of half baked, is. Um, uh, is that this kind of informs Galen's pessimism about um, treating. And then there are some mental disturbances that are simple, that have simple physical causes. Those can be treated, but ones that are, you know, what we call, what we would might really call um, psychological um, Ill, illness, Galen might be quite pessimistic about treating. Uh, and I think that this play, would play into that, but again, very half-baked. No, that's interesting though, though, kind of allows for kind of a therapeutic failure, kind of if you're like, if there's that kind of division. Uh, well, I see that Ralph has, I uh, would like to ask some questions. So I would call Ralph to the floor to unmute yeah. and ask his question. <clears throat> Thanks, Eileen. And Thanks, Andrew. That was a really, really interesting paper. You know, great, great passages. Um, I have a question that uh, I'm not actually expecting you to answer in a definitive way, because I, I don't know whether Galen actually White answers it himself, but it's in passage number, your passage number 19, because I have been sort of like trying to figure this out myself over the last months and months. 
when he talks about um, how the the appetites can't be educated, you know that it's you can't. Okay, so you can't you can't educate them because there's something inherent in that word pedusis and conceptually with them, which I guess is associated with logos and rationality. And because they're repetitive, you can't educate them. So what? And yet you want to change them. So you punish them or whatever the word kolazda, I mean, you, what do you say, chastisement? You, so it's all about training and discipline and doctrine and external, all this kind of stuff. And so, I mean, the question is, in my mind, and my question for him is like, what does he actually think is happening to the appetites when you're, um, when you're chastising them or when you're you, like beating them down, it, it, it's a it's another very um, sort of depressing sort of I think de depressing view of of human psychology in a way. So it's like the best you can do. It, well, the best you can do is if you're an utter stoic, you can extirpate them entirely, just get rid of them and live a kind of ascetic, motionless, emotionally motionless life. Uh, but that's usually not possible. So you have to live with them. And so you live with them by <laughs> beating them into submission or something. So what, what do you think in you, since you've been wrestling with these passages for a long time too, what's going on there? Do you think for Galen? Um, that's a very good question. Thanks. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's certainly already the kind of, it was certainly the question that I've been worried about. Um, I guess one thing is, I mean, Galen. If I, you know, if we could if we could resurrect Galen. I bet he would he would dodge the question a little bit by talking about faculties or powers. You know, we don't um, because he he, hope, he acknowledges that talking about faculties is partially a way of talking about material things. We don't quite know what they are, but you can see their effects. Um, so he would probably say, well, so clearly there's some material dispositional change that goes on when you yeah. manage to avoid expressing your anger or whatever or your um, your gluttony um, as often. Um, I guess more fundamentally with the pessimism, I mean, there's a, a passage that I didn't talk about here, uh, I didn't uh, present, just about the, how this all fits in the teleological structure, which I was thinking very much about during your talk as well. I mean, even in, for Galen, even the prudent, healthy person will still feel some emotion, some of the lower emotions, the emotions of the appetite. Uh, and in their own right, teleologically, they're doing what they're supposed to do. It's a function of the appetitive soul, uh, yeah. uh, therefore the purpose to feel these things, but the mind um, just curbs them relentlessly. And that's what the mind yeah. ought to do. It's um, the thing about that, that your last point though, uh, not even though, it's just like, you're right. It's, it's that he, you know, it's Galen is not happy with that situation in, in affections and errors. It's just clear that he's, he's, really begrudging. He concedes that you need to have sex to procreate, fine. You need to eat or otherwise you'll die. But if it's, you really do get, I think, you get the impression from that work in particular that if you could just get rid of them all, he'd be happy and happier. And that humans would be much better off not having anything to do with those because they are kind of intrinsically intractable in a way. And so all you can do is constantly work to keep them in check but i mean maybe that's my pessimistic view of, of him on that but i think i think you're very right about his discontent there um and i mean as all you know you mentioned you know we would adopt the darwinian uh uh framework looking at this that in some ways that would have helped galen a lot because then he could yeah. explain why all these pieces don't fit together um but i think that's right yeah well had to wait till now <laughs> Thank you, thank you. I don't want to say any more, but it's a really, really rich topic. Thank you. Are there any more questions? Uh, you know, I think we have time for maybe one more. I'm just like staring at the chat to make see, see if any materialize. Okay, perhaps not. So thank you so much, Andrew, for that uh, rich talk. Um, much appreciated. I think the idea of resurrecting Galen is uh, ugh, like on that. Maybe this is something we can do at midnight, you know, uh, with the Ouija board or something. We can get Galen uh, here. But thank you so much, Andrew. So let's all do the clap. Okay, so our final uh, speaker is Molly Mata.
Uh, so Molly Mata is a PhD student at Rutgers University. She holds an MA from the University of New Mexico and a BA from the University of Texas at San Antonio. She is currently working on special topic courses and candidacy exams, the first of which is on Plautus and the second will likely focus on spaces of isolation and possible worlds in Greek tragedy. She's broadly interested in depictions of the emotional states of suffering and pain in Greek and Latin poetry, and thereby developed an interest in the Greek and Roman medical approach to painful or distressing emotions and the experience of pain. She has presented at Camwis on Sophocles and on chronic pain in the letters of Seneca. So Molly's talk will be using literary aromatic space to prevent emotional distress in Galen's day in Dolentia. So let us give us a round, her, uh, a round of applause and uh, invite her to come uh, unmute herself and give her talk. Hi, thank you, Eileen. Um, I've dropped my handout in the chat. Um, it mirrors the presentation, but if um, it's easier for you to follow along on a handout, uh, you may use that. Um, there are many repetitive passages, so they just repeat as the presentation does. Um, it says the, I can't share my screen. Eileen, are you able to enable me to share? I will look into that right now. Okay. okay. Um, let me just click on to it. Um, I should be able to make you a uh, co-host and maybe you can do that right now. Okay. Okay, that worked. All right. Um, Galen's avoiding distress is presented under the conceit of a sought after letter from an unnamed interlocutor who requests that Galen explain how he is able to avoid emotional distress or lupe after suffering devastating material losses in a fire. After describing what was lost in detail in sections 54 and 55, Galen describes how he is able to avoid suffering emotional distress. His method involves imagining that he has lost everything and been banished to a desert island. His strategy is all the more potent and necessary given the extraordinary challenges of living in a precarious political situation during the reign of Commodus, which he describes in surprisingly strong language given his position as uh, Commodus's physician. So the passage is shown here. You are persuaded, I think, that in all of recorded history, there have never been atrocities as severe as those encountered recently during the brief reign of Commodus. Witnessing each of them day after day, I trained my imaginative faculties for the loss of everything I own. Expecting to be judged just as others who have done nothing wrong and sent to a deserted island. When someone anticipates banishment to a deserted island, together with the loss of all of his possessions, he prepares himself to endure it. If somehow he would have anticipated losing only part of his possessions, deprived of none others, he would have been distressed. My presentation shows that Galen's method is a strategy of training the soul to imagine the worst case scenario within the eremitic space of the deserted island, the Nasos Eremos, and that this strategy was one developed from a literary tradition in conjunction with actual historical banishment practices. I will look at the trope of the desert island in literature that Galen was likely very familiar with, at least indirectly, from the Odyssey and Sophocles Philoctetes to Ariadne's speech in Catullus 64. Since Galen's practice of training the imagination is a preventative measure rather than a curative one, and for more on that, you can um, see Christopher Gill's work in the bibliography, I read it as a therapy that takes the Aristotelian theory of drama as a cathartic force that purges negative emotions from trauma and morphs the idea from a curative standpoint to a preventative one. As Nutton writes in his introduction to his translation of the work, quote, this is not some piece of airy-fairy theorization, but an explanation of how a desired situation in the future can be predicated on the basis of what has already happened in the past, end quote. In hygiene, Galen argues that emotions, including lupe, can cause fevers and the beginnings of major diseases. 
quote, for passion, weeping, anger, grief, unnecessary anxiety, and severe insomnia arising from these things kindle fevers, and the origins of major diseases are established, just as conversely an idle mind, folly, and all in all a spiritless soul often produce pallor and atrophies through a weakness of the innate heat. For it is necessary, above all, to preserve our innate heat within healthy limits. It is preserved by the occurrence of moderate exercise, not only of the body, but also of the mind or soul. A significant witness of this argument is our ancestral god, Asclepius, who ordered a number of odes to be written and humorous mimes and certain lyrics to be created in which more violent movements of someone who was passionate made the crassus of the body hotter than it should be, while for some certain others, and there were quite a few of them, there was hunting, horse riding, and practicing the use of arms that did the same. So some emotions can cause feverish diseases, while idleness and a lack of emotions, asthumas, cause pallor and atrophy. Balance must be achieved, and Galen illustrates this by citing Asclepius, who he claims ordered mimes, lyrics, and odes to be composed so that he could stir up the passions for the activity at hand, creating a workout playlist of sorts, making sure to gauge the level of passion in the compositions and match it to the level required for the activity, sprinting versus jogging, for instance. Galen is thus aware that music and poetry affect human emotions. His use of the literary image of the desert island is born from this awareness that narrative can be an effective therapeutic tool, but what Galen is presenting is not narrative therapy, but a sort of imagination therapy, imagining the worst possible, the worst narrative possible in order to avoid feeling the distress that would come if that narrative were to manifest. The worst narrative, according to Galen, is the desert island, the Nasos Eremos. This scenario is brought up as a part of a sort of brain training. If one imagines the loss of every material possession and the banishment to an island bereft of companionship, one will be prepared to accept the more trivial losses that will more likely occur. This training is marked by the athletic verb egumnasa and recalls the beginning of the piece when Galen identifies the reason for its writing in section one. He has been asked to provide either some words, logoi tenes, beliefs, dogmata, or some practice, tis askesis, that helps him to avoid distress. This practice of imagining a desert island scenario seems to fall into the realm of askesis. Imagination and storytelling are evoked as forms of mind training that allow you the possibility of retraining the brain, to borrow from common parlance. The fact that this description of a quite narrow sort of training comes just after the mention of both a passage from the tragedian Euripides and the atrocities of Commodus is no accident. Galen often quotes Euripides in avoiding distress and elsewhere to support his arguments. And I'll read this passage from the slide. What Euripides put into the mouth of Theseus somewhere is true above all, as you will recognize when you hear. As I once learned from a wise man, I fell to considering disasters constantly, adding for myself exile from my native land, untimely deaths, and other ways of misfortune, so that, should I ever suffer any of what I was imagining, it might not gnaw at my soul because it was a novel arrival. In this passage, he seems to be claiming that developing an expectation that you will lose everything or training your mind to operate as though you have that expectation is an effective way to avoid pain when you lose something. That is imagining the worst case scenario can be therapeutic since it will temper your reaction to the actual less bad scenario. This consideration of the worst one may suffer is also known as the stoic practice of premeditatio malorum. Galen seems to have co-opted this idea from Stoics and Epicureans. Seneca advocates the strategy in his letters to Lucilius, and there are passages in Marcus Aurelian's, Aurelius, Arians reported the discourses of Epictetus and Quintilian VI that discuss premeditatio malorum, but the emphasis on the visual is unique to Seneca. Pierre Hadot, who draws heavily on the Stoics and Epicureans for his practical philosophy, argues for the method as a spiritual exercise. Quote, in the exercise called premeditatio malorum, we are to represent to ourselves poverty, suffering, and death. We must confront life's difficulties face to face and remember that they are not evils since they do not depend on us. The modern Stoic admirers are even in on the tactic. An August 2020 article by Eric Viner in the 
Wall Street Journal mentioned this strategy and mused on how a modern Stoic might apply it. Quote, a good Stoic would have prepared for the pandemic by practicing premeditatio malorum or premeditation of adversity. Imagine the worst case scenarios, advised the Roman senator and Stoic philosopher Seneca, and rehearse them in your mind, exile, torture, war, and shipwreck. A modern Stoic's list looks a bit different, a screaming child, unpaid bills, a worrisome fever, but the idea is the same. By contemplating calamity, we rob future hardships of their bite and appreciate what we have now. Adversity anticipated is adversity diminished. The Stoic practice involves repeating dogmata, precepts, and fables to oneself during the vis visualization of the worst case scenarios. In doing so, the Stoicist convince, convinces themselves that the evils imagined are not really bad, but something one must accept. For more on this, you can see Robertson, 2010. Galen, however, does not propose premeditatio malorum as a strategy used in order to achieve complete emotional indifference to total loss and isolation, as modern and ancient Stoicists advocate, but as a strategy to dampen the distress while acknowledging the impossibility and undesirability of remaining totally undisturbed by the vicissitudes of life, as he states in section 68. Quote, some people consider that remaining undisturbed is something good, although I know that neither I nor any other human being nor any animal supports this, for I see all of them wishing to be actively engaged in both mind and body. But we have established this in several of our tracks, especially in Against Epicurus. End quote. The imagined scenario seems to have two parts. First, you lose your home, possessions, and access to your homeland. Quote, when someone anticipates banishment to a desert, deserted island, together with the loss of all of his possessions, he prepares himself to endure it, end quote. The loss of possessions combined with banishment to what I labeled in my title an eremitic space, that is a desolate space that might be a fruitful place for the imagination, is the worst case scenario Galen is practicing to steal himself against. This imagined space of isolation is a common theme in tragic drama, which Galen draws from as a source text for his philosophical therapy. Aromatic space is a term used by Rush Rim to describe dramatic space in Greek tragedy. A Freudian theory of imagined space posited by Mark Griffith envisions theater as a potential space similar to a dream that projects the dreamer's conflicting desires and habits. In the imagined space of the Nasos Eremos, Galen has created a dramatic space in which to conduct his training, just as his literary pre predecessors created a dramatic space for imagining painful scenarios where a human being is cut off from their community and suffers alone. And what follows, we will go through several instances of isolated space and specifically examples of other desert islands in Greek literature. In Euripides' Hecuba, Agamemnon exiles Polymester to a deserted island using the Nasos de Eremos phrasing. Rain points out many other eremitic spaces in tragedy that are not necessarily islands. Examples include the cave Antigone is banished to, the isolated space where her brother Polynices is left to rot outside the city, the deserted beach where Ajax falls on his sword, and Scythia where Prometheus is chained to a cliff. These spaces could be seen as imaginative locales for cognitive experimentation. What goes on when one is outside the city, the community, society, or civilization without access to their usual co material comforts and verbal communication? There are many islands in the Odyssey. Calypso's is described as far away, Peloth, and another passage in Odyssey Book Three ties together this eremitic space with the idea of the worst case scenario. In this passage, Nestor explains to inquisitive Telemachus the fate of Agamemnon on returning from Troy. Nestled within that explanation, Nestor mentions an unnamed singer who Aegisthus left on a deserted island to be eaten by birds. The fate of this poet seems to be the exact sort Galen is training himself with. The poet is forced to leave his livelihood and community and is essentially condemned to a sort of eremitic death, a death by lack of access to the necessities of human life, community, social standing, and communication. The eremitic space of Philoctetes serves a similar purpose since, as we see on the next slide, the island Philoctetes has been left on, Lemnos, is described by Odysseus in the opening scene as uninhabited and untrodden by mortals. 
Though the phrase nesos eremos is never used, there are many uses of eremos and other words for isolation, alienation, and lack of community throughout Philoctetes. I'll limit myself to two additional passages. In the first, Philoctetes pleads with Neoptolemus, quote, do not shrink from me because of fear and be driven away because I have been made wild, but pitying a wretched man alone, isolated, friendless, having been addressed, make a sound, if indeed you have come as friends. Here, Philoctetes begs for verbal interaction as he recognizes how unappealing he might be as a malodorous, noisy individual who is rejected by his community and abandoned. In fact, Webster's commentary notes that the use of the verb tithemi with the prefix X in the opening lines of the play is the same verb used of abandoning and exposing babies in contemporary texts, highlighting the horror of such a thing being done to a fellow soldier, a philos, and a male of equal status. In his analysis of this verb in Philoctetes, Guidal Naquet adds that exposure typically takes place in a, quote, alien and hostile space of the agros. This is emphasized by the curious hapax ap agriomenon, made wild, in line 226. In the final Sophoclean passage, Philoctetes again begs Neoptolemus, in this case, not to leave him alone, monos, and desolate among the evils he currently lives among, that is, the painful wound he suffers and the added pain of loneliness. This imaginary space where one can attempt to feel the isolation of an individual like Philoctetes would be subjected to is taken up again in Latin poetry by Catullus, a poet of the late Roman Republic. In the following passages, Ariadne is speaking after having been abandoned by Theseus on a deserted island. This speech is a narrative embedded within an ekphrasis and provides us with a vivid account of Ariadne's emotional and physical state that results from her abandonment. Ariadne cries out, is this the way then that after taking me far from my ancestral altars, you leave me on this lonely beach, perfidious Theseus. Like Philoctetes and the unnamed poet of Odyssey III, Ariadne has been extracted from her family, society, and her ancestral altars and placed in an eremitic space, albeit by choice. She is totally alone after believing she had found love and adventure. It is curious that Catullus took this direction in particular within the acrastic passage, since the initial dramatic space of the poem is a wedding ceremony between Peleus and Thetis. The tapestry thus vividly imagines a sort of worst case scenario, a dissolution of the union of Theseus and Ariadne and abandonment into an eremitic space. In this passage, Ariadne emphasizes how alone she is, how there is no hope, no way of escape, total silence. This is a space of malicious portent. Ariadne continues by describing the effect of the abandonment on her mind and body, how she can still feel and sense and how she is burning out of her mind with blind frenzy. It is this literary imagination that Galen evokes when he describes the, the practice of imagining oneself on a desert island as a method of preventing distress during times of loss. Instead of a dream space or a dramatic space, as in Griffith and Rame's theories of tragic space, Galen's imagined locale is more accurately a daydream or a visualization. If your imagination is trained by means of imagining a worst case scenario within an eremitic space, the pains of temporary or circumstantial losses will be easier to endure. This thesis is complicated, however, by the fact that Galen himself suggests that this is only an effective strategy if you have the privilege of a good education and the appropriate natural inclination, with which he transitions to a discussion of his family history and that his ability to do this is because of his education and perhaps because he was born this way, genestai toyutan in section 60, and this is handout 20. Additionally, although I'm confident that Galen is building on a tradition of the deserted island as an imagined eremitic space, it is also the case that actual people were being banished to islands in the imperial period. Sarah Cohen argues that this banishment to an island practiced by Nero, Tiberius, Gaius, and Domitian was an innovation of Augustus. Commodus himself banished his sister Lucilla and wife Crispina to Capri, according to Cassius Dio. 
It may also be that actual banishment to an island was a punishment for the upper classes, as Grabe argues in his discussion of Ovid's banishment, who she claims to see sees his own punishment as a kind of death. Perhaps Ovid would have benefited from Galen's approach. In fact, over a century earlier, Horace alludes to a similar philosophy in his letter to Augustus. This passage follows Horace's description of those writing poetry in the current age, and as he transitions to show the positive sides of poetry for education and training, claims that the poet, quote, loves the verse, he is eager for this one thing. He laughs at losses, escapes of slaves, and fires, end quote. These are, of course, the very things Galen is attempting to immune himself against. Michael Overholt's 2016 dissertation compares Galen's practice to exposure or a flooding therapy, and it examines in particular Galen's development of his therapeutic strategy from Plato and other authors. As Overholt writes, for Galen, the flooding effect, quote, means a subject has to create mentally the very events that would cause an intense, if not overwhelming, emotional reaction. The excerpt from Euripides' Theseus, at the very least, facilitates the sensory experience if not providing the whole of it, end quote. Thus, Galen is working within a rich literary tradition from tragedy and epic that continues in Catullus 64. The use in this passage of Nisos Eremos is hardly coincidental since the practice of island banishment, as far as we know, did not include actual deserted islands, but simply islands without the connections and comforts of urban life. Galen takes the unique position of co-opting a literary theme and transforming it into a sort of proto-cognitive behavioral therapy to inoculate those who practice this training against the effects of loss. However, unlike the approach of cognitive behavioral therapy that relies on shifting the patient's focus to the here and now rather than potentialities to alleviate symptoms of depression or anxiety, Galen's therapy focuses on the potentiality acknowledging the real possibilities of the worst case scenario. Galen commandeers the therapeutic effect that Horace describes as belonging to poets and transforms it into a preventative measure that wards off distress as opposed to a purging of trauma after the fact. Galen's imagined space of the Nasos Eremos functions like the stage of a dramatic performance within Aristotle's theory of catharsis, a space to visualize losses and feel them, thereby desensitizing to yourself to, to the negative states like grief and depression that come with loss. And unlike the Stoics, Galen's practical approach does not aim to eliminate emotions and achieve indifference when facing loss, but to reduce the potency of negative emotions and attempt to compartmentalize them. Also unlike the Stoics, Galen acknowledges that he is able to do this because of his great privilege in family and education, an acknowledgement that comes across as simultaneously condescending and as genuine self-awareness. Avoiding distress then provides us not only with an example of a text that provides new insight into philosophical therapy and how it may have some similarities with modern cognitive therapy, again, see Gill for more on this, but it also illustrates how integral Galen's literary education was to his therapeutic approach. Thank you. Thank you so much, Molly. So let's give a round of applause. Uh, so if you feel comfortable, Molly, Molly would you um, be comfortable like fielding any questions that um, individuals might have? So I wanna open uh, the floor to anybody who might have a question for Molly to ask. Um, certainly, I felt like your talk hit very close to home for us uh, in, the, in, the, in the pandemic. Um, so maybe while people are thinking about questions, I might, ask you one. Um, I think certainly um, talking about this language of um, exile and deserted, uh, uh, deserted spaces uh, certainly um, reminded me that Galen in his, um, his writings likes to present himself as an exile in a lot of ways that he's trying to, uh, you know, that he's, um, he's, it's almost not even an exile, but almost like a hostage that he's prevented to go um, going back to Pergamon, like this, uh, this uh, that he that he has to stay here and kind of roam or the Italian Peninsula. So I wondered if you might kind of say something a little bit about how Galen's self representation as somebody who's uh, you know um, isolated or being kept uh, from their um, their home or their uh, their kind of uh, in, uh, indigenous space or native space. Sure. Um, I mean, 
it's hard not to read Galen right now uh, with the lens of, of current events um, where people are suddenly jumping ship and saying um, uh, things opposite from what they were saying a week ago um, about their political connections and where they are as though they have no choice in the matter. Um, so it's, it's kind of hard to give Galen the benefit of the doubt right now, but um, I can try, I suppose. And um, it's, you know, it's hard to know what the realities were that Galen was facing in terms of whether he had choices about being Comnus's physician or not, um, and what the alternative would have been for him. Um, but if I think the fact that he was uh, resorting to this sort of um, worst case scenario of thinking uh, might contribute to us believing that he really did have um, a precarious situation and his sort of status as an exile or as somebody who who couldn't couldn't be where he wanted to be and was stuck sort of in a, a place of desolation from at least his own comfort and family um, would have contributed to developing this sort of um, coping mechanism. Thank you so much. So I see two questions in uh, the chat. So um... Uh, I'm, I apologies if I mispronounce your name, but Figgin, do you mind uh, unmuting and asking your question? Yeah, it's it's Figgin, but it's okay. <laughs> um, I was, thank you so much, first of all, because I thought your talk was really good and really engaging and really insightful. I was actually wondering if Galen also provides us with strategy strategies for imagining experiences of loss or being abandoned uh, to a deserted island because I feel like how can you imagine uh, or yeah how how can you imagine a specific experience of loss if you have never had any losses or uh, mornings in your life does that is does he provide that through the reading of certain types of literature for example or how can you imagine loss if you've never if you don't know the experience of loss that's my question right so I think that, that that's what um, he's drawing on his education for is he's um, drawing on these experiences he's seen in literature. Um, he's often uh, quoting Euripides to support um, what he says. So I think um, that he's drawing on these examples of uh, fictional characters he's read about in literature like Philoctetes um, or, uh, or the poet in the Odyssey or even the uh, um, various experiences of Odysseus um, when he's isolated and, and trying to get home um, to imagine this. Um, but like you said, it's difficult to to fully imagine the worst case scenario. Um, it's ju it's just a, a you know a, an exercise ultimately. It's a it's an ascesis. But um, he claims to the uh, interlocutor that that's how he was able to. Um, to cope with losing his um, his various material possessions in the Great Fire and his slaves to the plague um, and whatnot, uh, but but again, I don't know if Galen actually uh, would be able to experience the total um, isolation of the Nasos Eremos with the same um, positive attitude. Thank you so much for your question. So I see that Andrew, would you mind uh, coming forward and asking your question? Thank you. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I, I found that uh, talk really interesting and also very useful for me, just because I think I ought to think more about the literary influences on what uh, on Galen's approach to emotion. I was wondering, you talked a bit about the importance for Galen of being educated for um, you know this sort of extra mental exercise. Um, I might I might have missed something. Here, but I was wondering if you think Galen would find the Stoic style primeditatio malorum actively bad for non-educated people if it feeds their emotions too much. Um, yeah. Yeah, what a good question. Um, I I don't know, but I mean, I, I don't think that it would be bad. I just don't know if he would think it was uh, effective um, because he's, he's so practical about how how humans are, you know, embodied, and it's it's sort of impossible to achieve total indifference to the sufferings that we experience. Um, so I don't know that he would see it as bad. I think he would see it sort of ambivalently as um, that's just not that's just not an effective um, 
effective medicine um, as as he would uh, sort of view, you know, treating um, treating an illness with the wrong um, prescription. I see also another question. Um, Anna, do you want to uh, unmute yourself and ask your question, please? Yes, thank you, Eileen. And thank you, Molly. This was a fascinating paper. Um, it really got me thinking about sort of the strategies we use as we're all in certain types of isolation right now. Um, and I uh, was struck by that use of, of literature as sort of a, what I would almost call catastrophizing thing where we, we preempt that. But I've also learned a lot about decatastrophizing, um, realizing things aren't the end of the world. And I wonder if there's any sense in Galen as well of using literature to say, well, I don't know, maybe I'm not like Prometheus, so it's not that bad. Um, this might just show my you know, lack of knowledge about Galen, but I was curious if there was any use of literature like that. Um, I don't know of a specific example, but I do think that that's sort of what he's doing. He talks about how uh, if you've if you have three fields and you've lost one, well, you're okay because you've still got two fields and you can survive. Um, so I think that's sort of what he's going for with imagining the worst case scenario means that you've sort of decatastrophized your actual situation. Um, I guess it, it just means you really have to go far with the worst. It's literally the worst case scenario. You can't um, sort of, um, do it halfway. You have to really imagine the worst so that when it happens, um, it won't be actually as bad. And uh, you've thus sort of naturally decatastrophized your, your response. Thank you. That was a good question. Thank you. Right. Is there anybody else who has a question for Molly? If not, then maybe we can um, think a little. Oh, okay. So there is. <laughs> uh, uh, Daniel, do you mind uh, unmuting yourself and uh, asking your comment or sure. saying your comment? I'll just say it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this was a really, really interesting um, paper. And I'm really interested in this kind of uh, this practice of premeditatio. And I just, I, and you drew some similarities between and distinctions between how um, cognitive behavioral therapy tries to address kind of emotional self disturbance. Uh, I just wanted to point out something that I've been following for uh, studying for the last couple of months is this movement uh, that was started around, I believe, 1956 by Albert Ellis. There's a kind of therapy called rational emotive behavioral therapy, and they employed this exact practice where uh, they they call it rational emotive negative visualization. But you essentially go through exactly the steps that Galen was just outlining in order to uh, kind of steel yourself against that potential for it when it comes. So it might might help. Uh, elucidate the differences between that and uh, and what other more contemporary forms of uh, self-therapy are, are aiming at doing. Great, thank you. Okay, um, I, there's also a, a comment that I'm just gonna um, paraphrase that was put into the chat um, from um, a um, Chaley, um, who says that the concept of suffering, um, uh, that they're interested in the concept of suffering and how we use literature and narrative to cope or to heal, uh, particularly they're interested in the way that Paul's epistles like the Col um, Colossians discuss suffering and the narrative of Christ and bodily suffering. It seems as though Paul desires the catastrophizing of suffering. So I don't know if you have a response to that, um, but I wanted to make sure to, uh, to read and draw attention to that comment. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I haven't um, thought about uh, the New Testament in relation to Galen, um, but, but that's interesting. It, it reminds me sort of of the um, ascetic uh, movements um, later on in, in early Christianity, but um, I don't know enough about, about Paul to, to comment, I don't think. If anyone else does, I'd love to hear more about that. <laughs> Okay, um, so maybe uh, in the last 15 minutes of this uh, rich panel, maybe we can think a little bit about the commonalities that we've seen across the five uh, rich papers that have been presented today. So just to get things going, and I, I, I encourage everybody to do a free for all and just unmute and intervene. Let's get uh, a little bit messy here versus uh, this nice orderliness that we've had before. But something that I have seen um, across some of the papers is this idea of 
uh, failure, <laughs> um, talking about uh, uh, whether and how, well, well, how one treats, um, or even if one can treat um, uh, affective uh, disorders, um, and also thinking about um, children as targets of therapy. Um, so these are some of the kind of themes that I've seen. I think particularly this idea about uh, why failure is so wrapped up uh, in thinking about uh, the emotions and uh, their effect. So I don't know if anybody has anything to say on, um, you know, the, the five papers that uh, we have, uh, you know, listened to. Uh, anybody want to intervene, but I've just, uh, these are just things that I, about um, the pessimism, um, maybe leaving room for failure because, uh, um, you know, I don't know what, but uh, I just invite people if they want to respond or to intervene in this discussion to please do so. Now the wait, or, you know, I, I feel like I, I can't see everybody, but I usually do that, the look to try to uh, draw people out. I don't know, people's blood sugar is a bit <laughs> dropping because uh, it's around just, lunchtime. Just, just to, um, to, to get things going a little bit on that topic, I, I, again, this is kind of loose and you know, free associated, but it, the business that you just mentioned of pessimism, Galen's pessimism, it's something I've been um, uh, kind of debating with informally recently with Peter Singer. Uh, of course, you know, who's, who's uh, one of the great experts on the cycle, particularly in the psychological um, works of Galen. And, and um, because we're co-editing this volume, so we're in, in touch on all sorts of things. So, so you know, he, he, I take a very, you know, pessimistic view. I ascribe a very pe pessimistic view to Galen about um, the emotions, about human nature, all these things. He he's finds him a little i don't know if he says he's optimistic but he would say that something like there's all sorts of potential for humans also even in in uh, you know on avoiding distress the the um strategies we've just heard about uh there's supposedly you know there's something supposed to be uplifting about that it's no it's not so bad you don't have to catastrophize you can decatastrophize just follow my method and you know, just do it the way I did, and I got my wisdom from, you know, from from Euripides and from the others. Some of the passages we just heard about. Uh, so that that's a, I just throw that out there as a kind of um, point counterpoint. That's not settled particularly, but which, and I don't know whether it's a question of the temperament one brings to the reading of it, that makes you feel this way. You when you read these passages, I mean, some of you will know that my own. My own feeling about <laughs> Petty Alupias is that it's pretty disingenuous, you know, that that he's actually saying all these things, but is freaked out by what he lost. But that, you know, so these are just interesting, complicated issues to talk about. So I don't know whether anyone just to just to get things going. Rebecca? Yeah, could I, I mean, because I also sort of feel that on principle at the moment that we should never end too pessimistically, that you've always got to. <laughs> um, so, but I mean, I think there's two things. One is that you can sort of take a different, um, you can read Galen more or less pessimistically in various ways um, in terms of both chances of change and adaption and so on. Um, but you can also um, think about have we, I, I, this is a kind of rare thing for me to say, but is there too much Galen here in the sense of um, are there alternative kind of voices that would offer us a more positive view of the role of the emotions in kind of life and um, getting us healthy bodies and having healthy lives? Because clearly there's a sense in which if you have a kind of holistic view of body and soul and emotions and physicality and so on, that actually can be quite a positive that if you have lots of the right sorts of emotions that might make you healthier, um, might balance your body in some way and, and so on. So there are, there are kind of theoretically, there are 
kind of therapeutic, good therapeutic ways of deploying emotions in various ways, and that they're all part of our kind of um, moderate, integrated, happy, combining package. Um, so I just thought I'd I'd sort of um, put that out there, as it were, uh, in terms of the, the ways that this, this could operate. And I think certainly Galen has got a quite whether it's quite as pessimistic as Ralph was saying, but he has quite a negative view. He clearly has quite a negative view about certain sort of appetitive aspects of life, which I don't think we have to share. <laughs> right, I don't. Yeah. No, and he does. He does. You know, there. He does. Doesn't he say? I don't have the passage in front of me in the in the avoiding distress that he he does talk about. The moder his father's moderation. His father says, I think he said he says that his father uh, disapproves of people who are um, you want to want to just get rid of their sexuality. He doesn't quite quite put it that way, but he is talking about that kind of thing, their appetites. Um, so it's not an all or nothing thing for his father. And of course, we know how much he admires his father's wisdom. So there is. You know, when all is said and done, I th when all is said and done, I think Galen might say, "Yes, if I could be the one sage, the Stoic sage, it, maybe that would be good." But it can't be done anyway. You know, for like ninety nine point nine 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 people can't do it. So we got to live with what we have, and we'll have to just figure out a way to moderate it. It's just that what's interesting, as Rebecca was saying, back and forth. It's like the language he uses about this differs in different passages. So sometimes it really feels like it's all about um, fear and um, um, what's like imprisonment of bad things and the mm. and cap and closing them. And then other times uh, he does seem a little more open and kind of almost. Well, I would never say lighthearted about Galen, but 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 a little bit more. He can be lighthearted when he's kind of being sarcastic. So anyway, yeah, it's a really good, really good point. No, I also wondered about the 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 pessimism, um, you know, that one can read into Galen about it being attached to um, from which disciplinary perspective that he's writing, you know, I just can't help yeah. but not think about, uh, you know, the the classification of medicine as a stochastic art, like that there's this like kind of failure and that almost this a bit, you know, uh, this failure to treat uh, affective disorders, like, you know, because of, you know, uh, it's uh, hazy status leaves kind of sort of an open uh, for him uh, to claim that, you know, uh, you can't blame me as a doctor, you know, they, again, this really kind of issue or um, yeah. uh, credibility issue around medicine about it's kind of the failure implicated in it. And somebody like Galen, who is interested in expanding the domain of the doctor, not only to kind of uh, include the corporeal, but also things that are perhaps kind of troubling the boundary between the inco incorporeal and corporeal. So, you know, maybe something to say to a philosopher, say, why are you even kind of uh, messing with uh, affective disorders to say that, yes, there is failure, but there can be an intervention. So I wonder whether, you know, this pessimism is somehow um, implicated into, you um, uh, to his disciplinary perspective. So thinking about uh, uh, perhaps we would get a positive, more positive perspective. I'd be interested if there's a more positive perspective, uh, I mean, um, perspective from another medical author. Hmm. Oh, I see also we have uh, something in the trap from Nicolette who says uh, Galen's obsession with the failure of language and medicine too as well. So we're talking about uh, uh, the theme of failure. Yeah. Does anybody else want to inter intervene? I know that <laughs> again, like as Rebecca says, like, oh, we're ending on a very pessimism, pessimistic note. Um, maybe this is where uh, we're, we're drifting in these times. Uh, if anybody has anything optimism, except the it, optimism. Um, yep. I, don't, I don't have anything optimistic to say. I just wanted to, we'll leave that to, to others, but um, just, uh, it was a comment that somebody made early on can't remember which paper it was, but regarding what you were just saying, that it is really interesting, as is pointed out in Singer. I mean, Sing somebody cited Singer for this. Was it Andrew? I can't remember. Just that that he, um, and I think Peter's probably right about this. That it's weird 
that there's an awful lot of diagnosis in the psychological works, mm. but very little therapy, actual therapy. Mm. I mean, there's a little, like avoiding distress is kind of therapy, but mm. um, in the more theoretical writing about, about the affections and errors and character traits, it's more descriptive and um, it, it's you know, deeply technical in a sense or philosophical, but he doesn't really have a lot of like, um, like a manual, a diagnostic, mm -hmm. or he has a diagnostic, as a therapeutic manual. And so I don't know where that leaves us on the pessimism optimism thing. I just think it's just very, very difficult to know how to treat these mm. things. Mm. Yeah. Anyway. No, I appreciate that. Anybody else have any comments? Um, again, maybe people's blood sugars are crashing, you know, because it's like it's lunchtime on the East Coast and tea time and uh, uh, yeah. um, in the UK and the continent. So I don't know on that. But what I do feel optimistic about to be corny is how good these papers were, you know, uh, and, you know, just a real kind of high point, um, you know, for my attendance of the SES. It was just a very rich uh discussion and just seeing all these various approaches to a very generative topic. So, you know, um, if there's nothing more to say, I would like to end by thanking our speakers, you know, for uh, being here in this moment, which is, you know, full of, you know, confusion and distress and uh, a lot of emotions. And I just want to thank you all for uh, presenting your papers and to contributing to this rich discussion. So, you know, perhaps- Thank you, Eileen, for jumping into the breach. Uh when uh, Colin was taken out, you did a fabulous job. Okay, well, I appreciate that. Yeah, so that was great. To you, you too. Know, yeah, so let's, uh, w maybe we'll end off on this kind of uh, yeah. upbeat moment. <laughs> and I look forward to uh, reading and, uh, you know, learning more about this research as it appears in its various uh, formats. So take care, everybody, and stay safe. All right. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye. Thanks, Eileen.